I guess the only theme I found mythologically with the chapters that we read for this was, as I told you on messages, that um, there's an anti-Aphrodite, like low-key vibe to the myths mm -hmm. that they chose for this one. Mm -hmm. um, so the first chapter we read was them boarding the Andromeda, which Andromeda, like Percy said, is, you know, like they brought back his namesake, which mm -hmm. I love that they find subtle ways to put it into like near the beginning of each um, of each of the books, because the first one, it was Medusa. That was mm -hmm. kind of our first callback to Perseus. And so, yeah, Andromeda was after the Medusa episode because he uses the head to turn the sea monster that was attacking her city into stone. So um, he already has it. And then she had been um, she had been promised to her uncle as a bride, and he takes him out with Medusa's head too. So. Um, the, the Aphrodite tie with that one, though, is the reason that the sea monster was ravaging them was because um, Andromeda's mom, Cassiopeia, said that um, her daughter was prettier than Aphrodite. And <laughs> it, it always doesn't matter to the gods whether it's you bragging yourself or somebody bragging on your behalf. They're going to punish you anyway because you're the person that is supposedly better than them. They would. <laughs> yes. Of course they would do that. And then... Oh, and also for anyone who watched the show, the, like, statue of Perseus that they, that, like, little Percy and mm -hmm. then older Percy sees, that's, that's, like, the Andromeda, like, thing of him standing there. That's what that is, if that helps people remember what, or what the heck is even going on with that statue since they, since Percy stares at it for, like, two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love that they included those little bits. They definitely fleshed Sally out so much more with stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's still question marks on her parenting, even even with her being a little bit more positive in the show. Yeah. She's yeah. not, I, that's what I like about her is that she's not a perfect person, that she's who like a mom like this would actually be if they had Percy when she was like 19. Yeah, I mean, when you have your kids young, you do a lot of growing up with them. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's to their detriment. But um, yeah, I think they they definitely give the feel that she's aged up in this one too. So um, they're kind of, I guess they're correcting for that in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah um so yeah we have them boarding the ship um and i think you mentioned this last podcast episode but there was like some back and forth about whether or not tyson was gonna go with them because of yes. where they were headed yeah and um i think that tyson getting to choose for himself was great but it also did give the feel that like okay, now we can't wait anymore. So because he's saying he has to go and we hear the harpies, let's take him. Yeah. And well, the thing I like about that too is Percy being like, if we don't take him, he's going to get punished by camp because, you know, we're gone. Yeah. And that's that's definitely true. They would have taken it out on him and they already don't like him. Who that, honestly, who knows what they would have done to Tyson. Yeah. If they, if they like, if he stayed behind. And so it's like a thing of like, I'm not going to let him get in trouble because of what we're doing. So even if you don't want him to come, he should, he should, he's going to come with us, like, period. And that's, a, that proves to be a very, like, good decision very quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. And I love that the hippo can't be love him, that they're just like, that the one rainbow was bonded to him immediately. It was doing tricks for him and stuff. many books with Tyson and so I was like oh hi I remember you <laughs> like I'm glad you're back <laughs> yeah it's so cute that it's like doing flips and and that um the little note that Poseidon must have sent that one just for Tyson because it's a little bit bigger mm -hmm. than the rest of them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah there's not too much substance to the hippocampi other than you know they pull Poseidon's chariot <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, I, I saw on Theoi and I, I love and hate Theoi at the same time because it's a site that people use that's pretty much the Wikipedia equivalent of Greek gods. And I know I haven't talked about, I've talked about this with you, but I haven't talked about it on the podcast. Um, it's, it's a step up from Wikipedia because it'll take excerpts and like actually write them out, but it doesn't always give the context of them. So when I was looking at the listing for Hippocampi, um, there was a selection from Jason and the Argonauts, but the context wasn't fully there. So I don't know what part of the adventure to the Golden Fleece it, it was actually in, mm -hmm. but possibly this is also a callback to Jason and the Argonauts going to get the fleece. That's cool. I like that. I like when he puts in little things like that, that if you know the myths, then it helps you understand what's going on in the story. And if you don't know them, it's fine. It just goes over your head and you'll figure yeah. it out later. I, I think it's so fascinating too, how the Greeks love these composite animals because we've had a chimera and now we have the hippocampi where it's like combinations of animals. The only other place that I've ever seen that depicted besides mythology is Avatar. You know, like they have the turtle yeah. ducks. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what is it? Legend of Korra. She has a polar bear dog um, that looks like a Labrador retriever. It's kind of cute. I could say something about Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood right now, but I'm not going to. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to skip over that because everyone's traumatized enough by that whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah um these chapters were jesus christ i was like oh my god these are so triggering for me personally and it's also just so frustrating to read them that yeah. and like no wonder why i don't remember anything from when i read these books many times the first time because my brain would have like deleted all of it because it would be too much for me but it was just <laughs> between Hermes and Luke it's just like what I don't even know what to do about this like it took me so long to read the chapter with Luke because I kept having to stop because I kept getting like triggered so then I like take a break and then I come back because that's the only way I can like actually pay attention to what I'm reading when I'm reading stuff like that but yeah. it was just intense like I knew that the like the princess Andromeda stuff wasn't fun but I honestly didn't remember what it was like. And I definitely didn't remember like that there's zomb like I didn't remember it for I think I feel like the most important thing about it to start off is that they don't know that they're getting on Luke's ship. Yeah. <laughs> that they they have no idea. They have no clue. They just think that they're they just know that Hermes sent them on this ship and Hermes phrases it as like, Oh hey, by the way, if you run into Luke like, you know, talk to him for me if you if you run into him as like as like an add-on or something not telling them that he's trying to rush them to get onto luke's cruise ship that they could have left another way and and like you know got poseidon to like give them a boat or made their own or something and I not have to be a, on that way yeah he led them directly to him yeah they're like they're literally little sitting ducks they have no idea what's going on they they know that the the cruise ship is weird like um it's really weird to think about that there's like mortal normal people mm -hmm. on the cruise ship that are just like i don't even know like um just out of it like i don't know the right word for how the state that they're in like almost like hypnotized and are just like reciting words, like they're reading like a script or something, but they obviously aren't really in control of what they're doing. And it's like, who are those people? Like, why are, why are they here? And like, who are they? They can't possibly want to actually be there. So. I, yeah, I, I get the sense that maybe they took over a normal cruise maybe, and they just put some sort of spell over the people. Yeah. I don't remember what resolution there was for that or if we ever see them again after this chapter. Yeah, I don't remember either. I know that the Princess Andromeda is Luke's ship for like the entirety of everything. Like it's stuff happens with that in the last in the last book. And so it's always his ship and it's one that 
is like consistently has a lot of monsters and stuff like that on it. And so I don't remember if they are able to get like the people off of it because it's like there's only so many things that they can actually do. And so they kind of have to like pick and choose, especially with Luke, like what they can do or who they can try to save. Um, but it's just more like concerning, I guess, in general for how they're doing things that they even have people like that on this like weird cruise ship that they've like some weirdly taken over and um i kept thinking like how like creepy and awful this is going to be watching on the tv show like yeah. watching them like get on the ship and not knowing what's going on and just kind of being like i don't know where there's literally nobody everywhere anywhere but we're here i guess we should sleep because we're exhausted because it's like 11 p.m. right now. So like, why not sleep? Okay. And then like waking up the next morning to the overhead announcer person saying that there's disembowelment practice um, soon and being like, what? <laughs> and that also is like such a disconcerting thing to think about alone that because the disembowelment practice is people practicing how to disembowel children from Camp Half-Blood. That the, yeah. that the things have on like your shirt yes. that they're practicing on. And disemboweling somebody is probably one of the more painful, like long lasting ways for somebody to die. Yeah. And they're teaching humans that they have with them and also monsters to kill people that way. And considering that monsters keep attacking camp, it's like, oh my God, that's like how, that's how brutal Luke is with teaching the people in his army how to attack literal children mm -hmm. that all look up to him it's just it's like okay this is really bad <laughs> and it, it's just like really like scary of just imagining them stuck on that ship and especially it's just so enraging that hermes didn't tell them he could have just said that's luke's ship because mm -hmm. if, if he could have said it and they might have ended up going anyway um like what they do when they when they realize that luke is on the ship that Annabeth and Percy are like, well, I feel like we have to at least try to figure out what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And it, so they might have ended up deciding to go and at least they would have known what they were going into. But the fact that Hermes doesn't tell them a single thing and they just end up in this situation is, yeah. it's the worst. It's like, okay, I don't know. One also thing is that last time I was like, why didn't Hermes ask Chris Rodriguez? It's because Chris Rodriguez is on the Princess of Gromado already. I didn't yeah. remember that, but I was like, oh, right. <sighs> that story is so depressing. <laughs> like what, what Chris Rodriguez goes through with Hermes is, is just so bad. <laughs> and I'm really interested to see them play that out on the show because they, there's no way that they won't, especially because they already casted somebody to be Chris mm -hmm. and named him as Chris, like, in the first couple episodes and stuff they're going to do that but um and the, these chapters do a good job of like almost bringing everyone but percy back down to earth of mm -hmm. like what luke is actually doing like how serious he is about all this stuff that like he's already recruited a couple campers to join him that annabeth knows who chris is even if percy doesn't know him well enough to recognize his voice it's still like they're on the ship where he's treat he's teaching people how to kill them all like yeah. specifically campers specifically them and is like just stuck there like okay what what do we even what do we even do now like it it made me want to like murder hermes when you see like when you the part when percy hears luke's voice for the first time and he just like freezes and it is like shit, like, and doesn't even know what to do because he's just scared. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck you guys. <laughs> like making him go and be around the person who scares him the most, like knowing that how scared he would be of Luke and just making him be around him anyway without even giving him the information. For, like it's it's that whole thing of you. he should be able to know. Yeah. And it, the, the whole Tyson, Tyson is literally like a literal lifesaver in mm -hmm. these chapters. 
Um, I, d I don't remember it being that brutal the first time I read the books, but I don't remember anything about this stuff the first time I read the books. Yeah. But it's literally at like when we get to like the end, it's literally like, like Tyson does what he does. Like thankfully him and Percy have already have a good like relationship so they can understand what there's what he understood what Percy meant when he said like go. But like if Tyson didn't do that, they're gonna take them underground and have a that word that's like dragon but not dragon, Drake Dracon, or I think it's I don't know how to pronounce it right. But they're gonna have that thing eat them. Mm -hmm. And then and then that would have been it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what? It's like this is like this this is like the beginning of the second book and that's where they are. I will say that it's very accurate to life how scared Percy is of Luke. Um especially the part when they're actually talking to him and he says that he's imagined all this time of like running into Luke again and being able to like yell at him and say what he wants to say and fight him again. But now that he's in person with him, he's just fucking terrified. Yeah. And it and is just shaking and doesn't know what to Yes. Yeah. Yes. That is like that is the like PTSD response. Like you get you can like believe that you can do all these amazing things when or just you imagine what you would do if you could have if you could have fought back or something mm -hmm. in your own head. But then when you're actually doing it, you're like no, I'm terrified of you. My nervous system is going into overdrive and I don't even know what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I'm just, I just kept imagining what it's gonna be like on the on the show, especially, I was like trying, I was like picturing Charlie's face in like his super preppy clothes like Luke is wearing, like being like a very, like I live on a yacht, like kind of dude. And just like picturing him, especially the things that he's saying are just like out of this world. Yeah. Like I, I made a video about this today, but I'm like, Luke is literally trying to commit genocide against the Greek demigods. Like that's what he's doing. He's, he's, they literally, they overhear him saying like it's, and he even says that I'm pretty sure to them at a, at a certain point, like. I don't know why you're trying to save camp because everyone's going to be dead in a month. And he's like, one thing actually with Chiron that I thought was interesting that I'm not sure that I figured out the first time I read these is that Luke is the first thing you hear Luke say is that he's happy that Chiron is like out of his position mm -hmm. and that he thinks that he'll never get his position back ever again um, because of Kronos being his dad, I guess, which is, <laughs> it's just wild to think about Luke being the one to say something like that. Yeah. Like, he thinks that he can, that he's using people's parental connections to, like, get them kicked out when he's a literal monster and is just getting away with it all because people think that his dad is nice or something. I don't even know. They, that's just, <laughs> that's the only thing I can think of. But um, it made me think about how about how if if there are people at camp that were like getting Tantalus or somebody like that in there, because it's a very good um, strategy for Luke for to get people to join him. Mm -hmm. If somebody who's running camp right now isn't doing anything to help anybody, they're not protecting you, they don't care about you, and the person who does care about you is gone and is gonna like die probably in Florida. Um, and that's it. And so it's a very easy way for him to recruit people on his side. If he just because it's somebody being inept at camp. And so it's easy for people to think that they don't care about them when they literally don't care about them. <laughs> when the person at camp doesn't care about them anyway. Yeah. And I'm just I it makes me wonder if if that is part of what what was going on there, because some of the uh, <laughs> Some of the gods are on, um, and the titans and whatnot are on Luke's side mm -hmm. in later books and stuff. And so, um, you don't, that could have been happening at this point and likely was. We just as the audience weren't aware of it. 
Yeah. Yeah. We get such a huge switch up with Luke that it really is going to be interesting to see how Charlie plays it. Um, because I mean, one thing you pointed out before is that a huge difference with how they did the ending scene in season one is that, you know, Annabeth knows. Annabeth knows right away. And we have her not finding out until these chapters we just read where he is having that villain speech and saying shit like, oh, Talia would agree with me. Like, delusional. <laughs> and of course, Annabeth, who knows her too, is like, are you kidding? Um, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this whole villain speech goes down because I can almost imagine it happening with Annabeth instead of Percy this time because mm -hmm. I mean she does get her quips in in the book but it would make more sense for her to be the one arguing like why the hell did you do that to the tree what the fuck is wrong with you yeah uh, because of yeah I, I I think a lot of the um a lot of the Luke interactions especially in this book are for Annabeth not Percy because Percy knows who Luke is at this point he doesn't he gets it he knows that Luke is gone that he's just an evil person that he was pretending to be nice but he was never actually nice everyone else is still trying to gaslight themselves about Luke and so him being there having to watch Luke be say like the most manipulative stuff in a row to him in a way that all abusive people do is horrible for his tiny little brain and it makes me mad that um you know that Hermes subjected a 13 year old kid to going through that but like he wasn't like shocked by it necessarily by any of that stuff with how he's talking about it even he's trying to like get through the like get through being on this on Luke's ship but he's trying to get whatever information he can and trying to get off of it while still being alive but he's not that's how he looks at it as soon as he hears Luke's voice. He's like, okay, we're in serious danger now. We need to figure out what we can and get the hell out of here before we all die. But like people like Annabeth and the kids at like at camp that are still there that aren't here, they're the ones that need to hear Luke literally being like camp is everyone at camp is gonna be dead in a month. Um, you're like a weak bitch for even trying to save them and just all the other things that he said like he literally i was reading this i was like did rick riordan meet my dad <laughs> like did he actually meet my dad <laughs> like i know he didn't but that the conversation with luke is exactly how interactions like that with really abusive people like that go and i was just like this is wild that he's getting this like so accurate where it's like hard for me to read it <laughs> because because of how disorienting and confusing those sort of discussions are and like the whole Thalia comment of like oh Thalia would be on my side if she was alive like granted him thinking that is where we get one of the most iconic scenes that I'm so excited about seeing on the show where he's like you don't have the guts and then Thalia is like fuck you and kicks him off of a cliff because and she can do that because he doesn't He's like, he literally tells her, I don't think you have the guts to kill me. And, and she's like, actually, yes, I do. <laughs> and, and they're, and like, they're all like disappointed. The only one that isn't disappointed is Annabeth afterwards when they, at the end of that book, when they found out that he somehow survived that fall. <laughs> but everyone else, like Thalia and Percy and stuff are like, damn it. <laughs> um, but there is, so that is funny in and of itself, but especially like the like the gaslighty stuff of like you're saying something and you're saying it where you sound like you are saying the truth where i feel like a crazy person questioning you but there's absolutely no way what you're saying is actually true is like when he says that and then he tries to argue that annabeth being around tyson like a cyclops is somehow worse than what he you are literally killing her <laughs> like you are literally killing Thalia you are not only are you killing her you're killing her so you can kill a bunch of other kids that she probably still cares about and you somehow in your little brain have decided that her being killed by you or like her being turned into a tree by Zeus in the first place is somehow worse than you killing her right now so that you can kill everyone else she ever met <laughs> like and and I was so sure about that, that you'll say that to Annabeth's face. 
And like some of the comebacks with Annabeth are great where she's like, where she calls him stupid, where she's like, obviously you don't have any intelligence here. You're a fucking monster. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so that's going to be fun to watch her just be like, what is, are you like mentally deficient? What is wrong with you? But yeah, that, that it's like the characters in that scene are all having like a different scene. Like Percy is just like, this is going to be horrible. I just want us to get out of here still alive. Yeah. Like, and so that's going to be fun to watch her just be like, what is, are you like mentally deficient? What is wrong with you? But yeah, that, that it's like the characters in that scene are all having like a different scene. Like Percy is just like, this is going to be horrible. I just want us to get out of here still alive. And it, I know this is going to be awful and I'm terrified, but I just want to survive. And Annabeth is like, for the first time, probably really realizing just how bad Luke is and then tries to gaslight herself in later books to convince herself that he's not actually this bad. But that's very much like what's going on with her in these in like, especially this part of this book, especially mm -hmm. because Tyson is the one that saves them. Yeah. Um, yeah, she doesn't know what to do about that because she's trying to hold on to not liking Cyclops, but it one scene that I thought about with this show is when Tyson is using like his mimic thing to mm -hmm. say out loud like who's talking in the next room. And that not only will that be like a cool scene to see in general, and yes. it's the only way that they could ever know like what Luke is actually saying. Or like knowing that he's like heard them and knows that they're there before he you know comes out to find them so they're not completely surprised by him but it's also interesting because annabeth is scared of her of him being able to do that because that's what the cyclops did to her when she was younger but it's the way that it's presented in this book it's very like a morally neutral thing mm -hmm. like tyson doing that is not him being scary he's not trying to trick anybody he's literally just trying to eavesdrop on a like a murderous maniac so that they can try to get out of here alive. And I just, I like when they do things like that of showing things that could be seen as just purely bad in, in like a different light because yeah, yeah. Like there's nothing wrong with Tyson for doing that. Um, it's not an evil thing. It's only evil if the person who is using that skill is using it to hurt you, which is very much the kind of theme <laughs> with like Tyson especially in this book with juxtaposed with somebody like Luke yeah yeah because we know from Tyson at least that there are monsters all over that ship I mean they only come in contact with two which that's our other anti-Aphrodite story is mm -hmm. Agrios and Aureus I believe was their names um mm -hmm. so their mom didn't a ace Aero and went to go be a huntress but sometimes in greek mythology people who are too ace aero and like talk about love in such a disparaging way aphrodite will punish them anyway mm -hmm. and so she got punished with getting attracted to some bears and she has these giant children who the mythology says they don't fear gods and so like we have those giants we have the lystragonians who knows what else is on this ship because it's probably a huge cruise liner with like tons of monsters on it yeah. and yeah that's all we see and all tyson can say is it smells bad because you know he doesn't i'm sure even if he knew exactly what else was on there he wouldn't know how to explain it no i don't um the way they put it is like tyson isn't old enough in like cyclops years to be able to tell and that makes sense because he is they are still all kids yeah. So it makes sense that he wouldn't, that maybe when he's older, he would be able to do something like that. But since he's also a kid, he can't, but it's also just the thing of him immediately just being like, it smells really bad on here. Something bad, something really bad is happening here. Mm -hmm. um, which is helpful even before he starts doing stuff to try to help them and protect them and stuff. Um, yeah, that's just going to be wild to watch on the show is Tyson being like the literal hero. Like, I love that. I love that Tyson gets so mad at Luke calling Percy stupid and a bunch of other names that he just attacks them. He like breaks a chair and just starts attacking them because it, he gets so angry, which like, that's how I feel when people are mean to my friends. <laughs> but it's still like, 
it's very sweet. It's like a sweet thing to he see how protective he is of him to be like, stop talking shit about my brother. I will kill you right now. And it's that whole scene with Luke is so like disorienting because of all the different things that Luke is saying and how they like contradict each other. And like, I went back to try to reread some of it to try to remember everything he said, because it, I was like, there is just so much happening in this one little section <laughs> that I like, I'm like trying to like keep up. Um, but one of the things that is like automatically like contradicts itself is he's, he tries to make fun of Percy for Tyson being his brother. He says that it's proof that Poseidon doesn't care about him. Yet at the same time, he's in this room with Tyson where he's attacking people with chairs to try to protect Percy. So are you really sure that he doesn't care about him because he just gave him a brother that is willing to attack anybody who's ever mean to him? Mm -hmm. And then at the same time is also making fun of them for being around Tyson because he's a Cyclops and acting like he's bad and evil and less than because he's a Cyclops. But at the same time, he almost takes out the bad guys, the, the bear twins that he has, and they have to like use strategy to stop him so that Luke can like try to kill them without Tyson stopping them. And Tyson is the reason why they get away from Luke. And so like, are you sure? Are you sure that Tyson is like less than? Like you're trying really hard to convince them that Tyson is less than and you're better and smarter than, than them while Tyson is the one, is the reason why they get away. So actually, I'm pretty sure that Poseidon actually does care about his his son in this instance. And that even if it's not something that makes sense, he clearly made that happen for a reason. And this was probably the reason. <laughs> uh, and it's just one of those things If he's trying so hard to make it seem like he's so big and bad and like they always do. But when you have time to actually stop and think about what you're doing, which you absolutely don't have time to do that when it's actually happening to you. When you think about it later, you're like, oh, right, that doesn't actually make any sense. What the hell was he talking about? <laughs> and it's just to, to go back to stuff with Hermes. One thing I forgot about with Hermes that made me irrationally angry. Well, it's probably rationally angry, honestly, is how he he gives Percy all of these like gifts for them to use on their quest. And he explains how to use like the wind so that they can get away like I read like a tiny bit of like the next chapter and it's literally Percy yelling at Annabeth to like strap herself into the boat because he's about to use the wind. And if she doesn't strap, like tie herself down, she might just like fling on the boat because of how much the wind makes them move. Um, so they're, they're going to use it, but it's also a thing of that whole thing is, is way worse once you realize that the ship they're on is Luke's ship and that he didn't tell them about that is like he basically makes it impossible for them to say no because he gives them a bunch of gifts mm -hmm. and it's really hard to tell somebody no when they're giving you a bunch of stuff like this is a literal like people pleasing like tactic and and like people pleasing is manipulative you can get mad at me for saying that but it's not going to magically not be true <laughs> like and, I, and i'm someone who's done that before for many years i will admit it fully admit it because yeah. yeah, I would do stuff like that. I would try to like buy people stuff or give them gifts or do things nice with them when I thought that they would be mad at me because I knew that I was trying to manipulate them or do things that they didn't want to do. And so it's easier for, it's, e it's way harder to have somebody be like, here's all this free stuff for this quest. I want you to go off and like talk to Luke. I don't want to talk to Luke, but you just gave me all of this free stuff and you gave us enough food and water and clothes and money to get through this entire quest, which we wouldn't have had. And they don't have on other quests when they don't have a God like manipulating them into going. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty much an impossible thing for them to not go. And it, it's just, it's just horrible <laughs> that, that I'm like thinking back to what I thought about Hermes when I, when I, when we did like our first, one of these when we just like went over the gods and I was like, oh, I like Hermes. And I'm like, I want to stab Hermes in the throat. Like, <laughs> I, I think I hate you now because you're being so like the, the part when they're like talking to Luke and Percy is like sitting there being like, oh, your dad wanted you to know this. And I'm like, oh my God, this is just so horrible that this 13 year old kid is, is, like shaking and terrified 
and is like having to give like a message from this dude's dad because he's like making him be the one to tell him this stuff because he's too chicken to actually tell talk to his son himself mm -hmm. and it's just it's like the most ridiculous thing i've ever seen in my life that hermes is such a little bitch that he's making these kids do this stuff for him and put them in this situation like i really don't think that percy bringing up luke helped anything yeah <laughs> during during that interaction or like percy bringing up hermes to luke really really didn't help anything at all <laughs> like it really didn't make that any better it made it definitely made it worse and made him more angry at them I oh feel like God. Hermes isn't going because he knows it's like he's afraid of backbiter. He knows he's going to get freaking cut if he goes up to Luke. And it's like, even though, you know, he's not going to change his mind. And if you went yourself, he would attack you. You're going to send this mortal boy who's smaller than him. Like, yeah. what? What are we doing here? Yeah. And especially like a mortal boy who was just attacked by him in recent times mm -hmm. and probably wouldn't want to see him again and also i'm pretty sure that luke wouldn't it's not a good idea for them to be in the same place yeah like especially because all of the gods know that percy is having nightmares from chronos of chronos trying to get him to be on his side and you know he has that dream when what he says is like the scariest dream he's had so far when they're on the ship mm -hmm. but when they wake up in the morning and of Kronos doing trying to do things like that to him and Percy is is you know an abused kid so he's not gonna fall into that stuff of somebody trying to make him do what they want him to do mm -hmm. um but it is also a very stupid thing I would think to put him in a place like that where he is automatically in the line of fire mm -hmm. of Kronos and Luke and all these monsters that would all love to like they would be so excited to kill specifically him yeah um a prophecy kid a kid of the big three yeah there's so many reasons why percy has a target on his head and yeah like that's as these books go along it's kind of funny um that monsters will know like know him by name they'll say like his full name like perseus jackson and he'll be like what and like in like the later books they're like afraid of him where they like will sometimes will run away from him because he's killed thousands of them like the someone figured out the number it's like 5500 are like monsters like in the in like the later books, like Heroes of Olympus, there's a part when they go to Alaska, he kills like 1500 monsters in one scene. Oh my gosh. And you're just like, okay, well, yeah. <laughs> and like, that's Percy. That's, that's what he can do. But um, yeah, so it's like, that's very much a thing that's happening already is they would love to be the one to be able to kill the prophecy kid. And also kill a big three Poseidon kid like that. And, and to just like, kill any sort of like hope any of the other kids at camp or any of the other gods or anything would have had that this wasn't going to be this bad um yeah but with monsters already knowing his name that's Kleos. that's what Kleos is supposed to be it's supposed to be your name recognition gets you so much power and so being the monster to take that person down it's like you inherit that Kleos plus them you know the thing that I think is so funny about Percy's life is that he has all of that. He doesn't want it though. Yeah. Like he, he ha like just talking about the things that he does in his first quest that he kills Medusa, that he gets away from Echidna, that he gets out of the underworld alive and, you know, survives the whole thing with Luke um, is enough already that for most demigod kids, they would never they wouldn't usually never experience all those things and also survives fighting Ares. Um, and that's just like the first book. And so he has like what you would imagine Kleos to be, but he doesn't care about any of it. And he doesn't think that it actually matters. Um, that's like one of my most fascinating things to think about, especially in the later on books with kids that are meeting him for the first time and have this idea of him that doesn't exist <laughs> is that if you hear about him, offhand you think that he would be like jason or something 
you know, this big, bad, like, hero-looking person who does everything for the good of whatever, whatever, and, like, the god's little bitch, and, like, kind of, like, how Luke almost is talking to him, like, he is, but he's not, and he's not, he's not like that at all, but he's not actually like that at all. Yeah, he does all these things, but he also doesn't think any of that stuff necessarily matters. It's like, I do that because if I didn't do that, I would die. That's that's literally all it is. Like, he doesn't think anything he's doing is necessarily, like, special or different or interesting or whatever. He's just like, I just have to do this because nobody else will. And I also just have to do it. And that's, like, the end of the story. Um, <laughs> it's just one of those funny things of if you met him, you would actually met him and talk to him. You would never think that he is who he is until he started just... He's that person that like offhand mentions things that he's done in the most like lackadaisical sort of way <laughs> where like as the years go on, people, especially in the later books, they like hear little bits of stories and they're like, what did you do? <laughs> like, wait, what do you, what do you mean? What do you mean that you've met? Cause most, like most of the other demigods have never met a lot. Most of them have never met like their parents like their godly parents or they've only met them like maybe one time and it's like oh yeah i see my i see poseidon comes to my 15th birthday party and eats my mom's birthday cake and um and like warns me that everything is about to go to shit <laughs> like and because that's why that's why poseidon is there being like oh, everything is about to be really bad really soon so just like forewarning dear son um you're my favorite Thank you for the cake. <laughs> but like no one else would ever have like the big three kids, him and Nico have more interactions with their like godly parent and other gods also at the same time than most other kids ever would. So like the fact that he just sits there and talks about how he does this stuff, they just look at him like, who, who are you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, but it's, that's, the whole dynamic with him and Luke is very much that. Like, Luke wants so bad, like, so bad. He would, like, Luke is like that person that would literally turn into a crying little baby if he actually got, like, 3% of attention from his dad at any point in his life. He would become the god's ultimate bitch if he actually got that. He would literally do anything they asked. Because that's all he ever wants is to be seen as like the number one cool guy hero person who everyone loves and adores. And he's so angry because he isn't that and he thinks that that's the worst thing that's ever happened to anybody in his life, including him and everyone else he's ever met. But it, he but like it would make it probably makes him so mad that Percy gets that stuff like he sees his his dad more his dad even like adopted basically, or like claimed a, a Cyclops to protect him on this quest so that he would make it, make it through it and all that. But, and is, even though he's not technically there, he's still doing things where he's trying to protect him more than Hermes ever did towards Luke. And, and Percy like, doesn't necessarily care like that. And I feel like it makes him so angry <laughs> that Percy gets that stuff that he always wanted and gets to go on all these quests, but like Percy doesn't want to go on any of these things and he doesn't want the extra attention. Yeah. Um, and Luke must be like, but like Luke would like drool if the gods ever offered him to be a god. He would be like, yes, I'm going to be the best god ever and kill everybody. <laughs> he would have said yes, like automatically, like pretty much him working with Kronos is him trying to be like a god by proxy like thinking that he can like be around a more powerful god and, and he can be the most powerful one yes. um but yeah that's it just makes me laugh thinking about that that percy has this stuff and he's like i don't want it you take it yeah and it and like and luke is like nobody will even offer this to me you annoying ass child <laughs> well we got 45 minutes in before i mentioned harry potter but this is like, I feel like it's another thing that Rick did that I JK Rowling might have been trying to accomplish but didn't do it as well where I think this might have been something you pointed out as well in some of your Harry Potter videos that Harry has this inherent mistrust of adults because of his trauma mm -hmm. and 
Percy also does, but in Harry's case, we don't get the sense that the adults couldn't handle it if he went to them. And in Percy's case, we know that they wouldn't be able to handle it well because they're all gaslighting themselves. So at least it makes sense that Percy has this mistrust of authority. Plus, because he didn't grow up in the Greek and Roman world, like the other kids kind of had to go to Camp Half-Blood a little bit earlier. Um, and because he actually had a loving mother, his expectations for what dynamics are supposed to be are totally different. Um, and yeah, because he didn't really recognize that he was around monsters until he was 11 when he is faced with a monster that actually isn't isn't a monster per se tyson he can see his powers as neutral he can see like oh him being able to mimic voices is useful him being able to have this super strength is useful when you know people like annabeth who have experience are just like terrified of him even though they shouldn't be yep yeah and percy has it's kind of a miracle that percy trusts anyone um because of just what happens with luke it's amazing that he trusts anybody at all luke was the first person in this world that befriended him and made him feel like he belonged and helped him figure out how everything worked and he's the reason why he even brought annabeth on the quest with him and all this stuff only to find out that all of that was a lie and he was trying to kill him the entire time and then it's honestly amazing that he trusts anybody at all after that um and it's, I think it's why he clings so hard to like Annabeth and Grover, because not only because they obviously love him and care about him a lot, but they're like the only people that he's sure that he can trust. Mm -hmm. um, and stuff with Annabeth definitely gets very difficult in later books with Luke, but that trust like never completely goes away. Like they, even when things are ridiculous with hard with them, and they're not really communicating very well, um, that trust is still there, that they know that they love each other and they care about each other. And he trusts that he can go to her with things and she won't tell anybody else what's going on and vice versa. But it's pretty much just them. Like it's, it's, it's hard for him to trust anybody at all because of how badly he was betrayed by Luke and things similar-ish, not as bad as Luke, but still things like that happen in other books going forward like i'm thinking like with nico <sighs> god <laughs> that is also very difficult and so it's no surprise to me that percy follows like the abused kid sort of pattern where we don't have that many friends but the friends that we do have i will literally like kill god for you <laughs> if yeah. you ask me to just ask me and i'll do it that's not like a question that's just how much i care about you because you're one of the few people i've ever met in the entirety of my life that has actually been there for me and cares about what i'm going through and hasn't like used that to do something you know to me or like try to get me to do something that i don't want to do and all that kind of stuff but it yeah it especially yeah i just love the the fact that the newer books are the three of them going on quest together and it's like this the funnest like sweetest books like i haven't i haven't read the the newest one yet but i probably should because it's a very like low-key like happy like sort of book like percy's on like his school's like swim team <laughs> in those books like he's a high diver and like Grover comes and like Annabeth come to like his high school meets to like cheer him on and stuff. That's like a whole plot line in, in like those books because after Heroes of Olympus, they're giving us him with his best friends that don't have problems with him. <laughs> and they're just like having fun together. But it makes sense like why he would feel like that or why he would be so connected to them after, especially after Luke. Um, he has other people that he's friends with and friendly with in this world, but I don't think anybody ever gets as close to him as those two do, because it's just like, I think it's, it's just too much after something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yes. And also Luke was so short that that's why I do think he's able to make this switch easier than other people of like, mm -hmm. oh, that was all fake. Um, you know, Annabeth had what, six, seven years of gaslighting. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
it's the fact that he's new to him as much as it hurt him and as much as he really wanted to be like a long-term friendship it's so much easier to accept because it was like oh we had a couple of months at camp and that's it mm -hmm. oh and the thing i was gonna say about luke during that interaction that it's just one of the wild things that he says is the part when he's like i can give you everything you want um like percy you'll you'll be like rich you'll be famous your mom will never have to work again she can live in a mansion annabeth you can be like an architect and you can get everything you've ever wanted and annabeth is like please die i'm pretty sure that's like her actual words to him saying that but it's it's just the like the insane manipulation of that like that whole interaction with luke is a really good way of describing what it's like to be around super abusive people like that in your actual life because they will come to you and they will be and this is basically what luke says in this scene you are shit. everything that you believe is shit. you are pathetic your parents hate you no one likes you you're trying to save a bunch of people and it's not going to work why are you wasting your time doing this you're pathetic i'm so much better than you and i'm not even trying but also you should join me after I just like stomped you into the floor and made you feel like a tiny, like, like speck of dust on the floor that just got stomped on, you should join me though, after I just completely destroyed your entire like character and, and are now going to be like the internal voice in your head when you think bad things about yourself, I'm going definitely going to hear your voice, but yeah, I'm definitely going to join you. And that's, but that's literally what they're like is they try to destroy like your entire sense of self and say the worst things you can possibly ever imagine and even worse than you can possibly ever imagine about you. And then they'll turn around and be like, this is why I'm so mad at you because you just won't listen to me. So if you just listen to me and do what I say, then I'll stop telling you that your dad hates you and everyone at camp is going to be killed and you should just accept all of it. And it's just wild to hear him say all the stuff that he did before he got to that moment in, in that whole scene and then be like oh by the way if you just join me you can be rich or something and it's like but it also it also weirdly not not so weirdly honestly but it very much reminded me of what's going on with like politics right now with palestine because when i read that i was like yeah the only the, the price they would have to pay for getting all of that is letting everyone get murdered and knowing that that was going to happen and being fine with it and literally making money off of it. Mm -hmm. And it, I'm not, every once in a while, I see like a video on TikTok of somebody trying to say that like 17 year old Percy would have joined Luke. And I'm like, I need you guys to realize when you say that, that you are saying that your favorite, one of your favorite characters of all time would be okay with children being slaughtered and massacred because he is angry at the gods literally nothing in any universe ever could ever get percy to join luke ever nothing could make him join luke ever the gods could put him in prison for 30 years and he would never join luke the gods could kill everyone he loves every single day of his life and he would never join luke he would never be out because that's that's what's happening in this scene here like Luke is like, everyone at camp is going to be dead in, in a month when I just overrun them with, with monsters after Thalia dies. So stop trying to stop me because it's not going to work. Like that's, there would, that's not, that's never going to happen. Like, and I almost feel like I need to like almost state that, like, can we understand that this is Luke's plan at this point? Mm -hmm. Like he went close to camp where like his ship went close to camp hoping to like bait them into a fight like he that's like the first i think the first thing they hear luke say is that he went close to camp hoping that percy probably and annabeth would jump on the ship and try to fight him so that he could kill them that's the only reason why he did that so he's trying to bait them on purpose just to get rid of them as fast as humanly possible and that's that's wild <laughs> to like see it that's the that's why I always compare Luke to or I try to compare Luke to other villains because he does not fuck around immediately like people or everyone else but Percy is like almost catching up to how bad he actually is mm -hmm. um, like he's immediately just like 
no, I'm done. I just want to kill everybody. Yeah. There's no, you're doing this. Um, yeah. Or trying to, I mean, if there's no in between, there's no like, you know, it's not even that he's being manipulated by Kronos because was he manipulated? Sure. But also when you're willing to do things like this, you're, you're doing, you're doing this. Um, yeah. You're making these decisions to do this stuff. You're teaching your army how to disembowel children that all look up to you and are trying to, it's one of the what ifs from these chapters I thought about. It was like, wow, if Percy and Annabeth died at this, in this part, like all of like the domino effects of things that would have happened, like, like Grover probably would have died. Um, mm -hmm. So they never would have found Pan. If maybe Clarice would have found the Golden Fleece on her own. Um, but the only reason that she actually gets back to camp and they're able to fix everything at camp with the tree and Thalia and stuff is because of something that Percy does with Luke to stop him from, he literally does something to delay him from getting back at camp to stop them in time to give her enough time to fix everything. So even if she found the golden fleece, she never would have made it out of Florida alive, most likely without them there. And the prophecy kid would have been dead. <laughs> they would have had to find, and Luke probably would have found Bianca and Nico mm -hmm. in the in like the Lotus Casino, and he would have had Bianca be the one to do it because she was actually the older one. She was older one. She was twelve mm -hmm. um, when she was in there, so she would have then been the one. But it would have been really easy for him to get her on her on his side, considering that everyone else would be dead. Yeah. And also, Chiron would have died. Mm -hmm. It's just all because of this stuff, and it's just wi wild. Yeah, the stakes are so high, and it's yes. very subtle because, like, like you said, it's a domino effect thing. So it would be step by step by step, all of these bad things would happen. But yeah, if they would have died at this step. Honestly, it would have been so much harder to stop Luke. I I can't say for sure that the Titans would win again over the Olympians, but it would have been much harder. Mm -hmm. It would, and especially with all the Demi-God kids gone, the gods would have just been fighting without anybody else to help them. Yeah. Um, and they do use, like, and depend on, like, their children like that to help in battles like this. Mm -hmm. And so without them there to help, it would have been... It would have been so much harder. Like, granted, at least one of the Titans would have, wouldn't have woken up because Percy accidentally wakes one of them up in the fourth book. <laughs> but that, but still, like, um, the rest of them would have been enough for them all to handle on their own. And especially with Luke being there, um, doing what he was doing, the only demigod kids that would be alive were ones that were wanting to kill them. Mm -hmm. And yeah it's just it's it's like very intense from the very beginning of luke just being like i want to kill everybody and i'm trying to the one line that that percy says is such a good way to describe what it's like to be around somebody like him where he's saying like every time i think that i'm getting like my footing he says something else that like completely throws me off and so like in that argument he like says something about Poseidon, like, oh, does Poseidon really care about you? And then he brings up the fact that he knows everything about camp. That is terrifying that he's sitting there being like, I know that Tyson is your brother. I know that Poseidon claimed you. I know about the, the like, longitude and latitude coordinates for where the Golden Fleece is. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I know everything. And also, by the way, your dad doesn't care about you. And also, and also, do you know about this prophecy about what's going to happen to you when you're 16? When he said that, I was like, go fuck yourself, bro. Are you really telling Percy in the worst way, like in the most flippant way ever that you know about a prophecy that you, that you absolutely know he doesn't know about because they are, they told everyone not to tell them about this. That is that is about him dying when possibly dying when he's 16. Yeah. It's like, are, that's what you're throwing in your face and you're trying to say that it's the gods being bad because he doesn't actually know about this. At this point, he's in seventh grade. 
I don't want somebody who's 13 years old knowing something like that about themselves for that many years in a row. That's that's so much like pressure and that's not something that you should be putting on a kid quite that young if you don't have to. Like him knowing about it when he gets older, yes. But like telling him when it's that serious, when he's that little, uh, but that wouldn't exactly be the best thing. That would freak anybody out of uh, yeah. to know something like that. And like, it reminds me of like Harry Potter stuff of how it, nobody tells Harry that he has a fucking horcrux on his head, but, um, but they also p put it off way too far. But at least like with Percy, he already lives in a very dangerous, violent world. And that's like part of the motivations with, with that of not telling them about it because they, they want them to like make the decisions that they're going to make for themselves instead of being like feeling like they're forced to do it or or whatever like if you tell someone from the beginning like if you say yes to doing this prophecy you're gonna die one day very soon you're gonna die when you're 16 if you don't figure everything out and everyone else is gonna die too even if and they might die anyway even if you do die that's just so much pressure to think about every single decision that you ever make for the rest of your life how you're supposed to do anything at all if that's always in your head and so at least in this world that's very violent where he's constantly going on quests where people are trying to kill him all like all the time it makes sense why they would want to hide that from a kid like that who's always in danger anyway yeah. so like this being more danger is a lot but it's not like the idea of his life being in danger is a new thing for him it would just make it harder. It would just be too much. And like with Harry Potter, they're not like in that sort of danger all the time. Like it's, um, they have dangerous things that happen to them, but on like a daily basis, they're not having to worry about something attacking them when they're alone and having, and if they don't kill that thing, that thing is going to kill them in the same way. And so it feels much more like abandonment feeling to me when I compare those things, just because of how harsh the different worlds are, I guess. Yeah. I, you know, for some reason I'm thinking of Buffy and I didn't watch Buffy fully, but do you remember the arc where, um, it was like the season where Dawn appeared and she has to sacrifice herself. Yeah. Like that feels like something Percy would do to me. It feels like, um, this idea of like, well, if this is what's best for everybody, I'm going to do it and hope that everybody's okay. And honestly, a relief from all of this pressure wouldn't be the worst. <laughs> like, you know, like that almost comes to mind for me of how he approaches like these situations, especially in the show where we see him actively walking into situations where it looks like he's going to die. Yeah, that's very much what Percy would do like is willing to do kind of does do in certain situations like there's kind of a moment like that in almost every um in almost every book uh where a parent like the one in in this book is the this the uh, fight that he has with luke at the very end of the book that's that it's literally him using his body as like a shield to try to stop luke from killing other people um in like the third book, it's him holding up the sky, even though he knows that he's probably gonna die when he when he's holding up because he literally can't, he's a tiny little like demigod, he can't actually do it. It's hard for like the gods to do it. Much less, so he's like, oh wait, like, um, like Annabeth gets stuck holding up the sky longer than him, but she like doesn't know what's happening when, when Luke actually is the reason why that ends up happening to her, but, but like, she doesn't know what she, what's really going on when that happens, but he is aware, like, if I hold this up, this is, th this is going to kill me if I do this longer than a couple minutes at a time. And so it's a much, like, bigger thing for, to be aware that that is the risk that you're doing and just do it anyway. And then in the fourth book, he blows up the volcano and almost kills himself <laughs> um, to save, to try to get rid of all of the monsters that are burning his skin off in this volcano of Hephaestus's to save everybody else like he tells Annabeth to leave um so that so that she doesn't get hurt and then blows it up and almost and is basically nearly dead for two weeks of his life after that but she is she's fine he but 
you know, that's just what he does. And he does lots of stuff like that in, um, in the last book when it's just, the last book is basically just like a very intense, battle there's like scenes in between but it's little like they don't they hardly even sleep in the last book and so it's just like kind of a non-stop thing of many scenes of him doing things like that but yeah that's what that's what percy would do and he does do that because and it makes sense for who he is that he would do that like i saw this meme today that always makes me laugh of people being like, what would your, like the characters pretending like they're talking and being like, what would your last words be? And Percy's is finally. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. yeah. And like Annabeth is like, no. <laughs> and like this, in like the, in like the meme of it, she's like, no wrong answer. But I'm like, no, that would be his answer. <laughs> You're like, God, okay, that's fine. Now at least I can like relax about worrying about, all, about this whole death thing for all this time. Um, what else was I going to say about the, I'm trying to think of everything that happens with this chapter and just how atrocious it all is <laughs> um, to make sure that I cover it all. Cause it's just, there's so many abuse, like manipulation tactics that all happen like in quick succession that I was like, holy bejesus, there's like so many things to talk about just with that alone of all the different, cause I think, I guess the way to sum it up is like one of the most disorienting things about being around really abusive people that know you well enough to like know what your like the most insecure things about you are and like throw they throw those things in your face mm -hmm. a lot and just make you feel and they're the things that like even when you're by yourself and you feel like you're like no they're not telling the truth those like little doubts just like can never fully leave your mind um but it's just so disorienting to be around somebody like that who is going back and forth with so many different things that like like Percy says he like he can't keep up with what Luke is saying like he doesn't he literally does not have time to process what he is telling him like in like in a like a 15 minute section in this of his life in this book he finds out that they're on Luke's ship that he's trying to kill everybody at camp that kids at camp have already joined him that that like Luke knows everything that is happening at camp because he has spies there that like he knows where they're going he knows where the golden fleece is he knows everything and then also at the same time is like telling him you should join me to be rich but also I want to kill you because your dad sucks and I also hate my dad but also you're such a pathetic loser for thinking that your dad cares about you, but also you should join me because you'll be rich anyway. And it's just like, what, like, what is going, what is going on? Like, where am I right now? Like I've been in so many conversations like that and you leave it and you honestly don't even remember most of the things they even said to you. Like, that's why I kept like stopping when I was reading that scene because I was trying to actually remember what everything that he said in it <laughs> because I'm like I need to stop to like stop the dissociation from happening yeah. in order to like remember everything that he's even saying during these scenes which is why I don't remember any of them <laughs> um from this book especially from the years when I I I read Sea of Monsters so many times like Sea of Monsters was the like the binding of Sea of Monsters literally like broke like so I like threw it away like years ago because I read it so much um like it was like the book that I used to read because it's the shortest book so I could read that book in like one day um because I read really fast and I could read a lot of these books in one day but that one is especially easy because it's the shortest one but I used to read that book when I just wanted to, like a fun like escapism book and I don't remember any of these things like I read that book so much that the binding broke and I don't remember how horrible this all was from the beginning because my brain just blocked it all out every single time yeah. and it's it's like wild how your brain does that like i've been having that happen lately with like news stories and like the media or whatever like i've never heard that i know of a song by drake because i knew that he was a predator um i've never heard like a song by eminem since like 1999 because I knew that he came out with a song talking about how he wanted to kill the mother of his child mm -hmm. in like graphic detail. And, and I was like, well, you're terrifying. And so I pretty much avoided him ever since then. Like, um, I don't even read, like there's an anime that I like, um, My Hero Academia that has, 
an abusive dad that is so similar to mine that I literally have like repressed memory flashbacks come back when I like watch that show. <laughs> so I don't watch it anymore. Um, sometimes I even get it when I read fan fiction about it. But there's a character on that show that is like a very aggressive bully. And I don't even read his dialogue when I'm reading like when I'm reading like fan fiction with him in it, I skip over every part where he's talking and I just figure out what the plot is from around it. Like I read Percy Jackson fanfic and it, and if there's Luke in the story, I won't read it. Yeah. The only stories I will read where they talk about him at all is if he's dead, if he's around at all, I won't read it. And I'm like, wow, I'm kind of interested to see what happens with this, with like Charlie <laughs> as an actor, as this go forward with my brain, because I hate Adam driver because he's Kylo Ren. Um, like I can't listen to his voice or look at his face or anything like that because of how abusive Kylo Ren is. And I'm like, I don't want to feel this way about Charlie because he's so much younger. Um, but it might happen anyway, because he's playing a character that is so similar to those sort of people. And I'm just, when I was reading these chapters, I was just like, wow, this is going to be a really good episode of TV. And it's going to be so hard for people to justify the feelings that they have about Luke. Like, yeah. I'm just imagining the people that are like, oh, Luke had a point. Oh, like, Percy would have joined Luke. Having this sort of episode, seeing him be this, like, overtly horrible, saying the things that he's doing. And I do love, like, I guess the one, like, really positive thing I love about this chapter is, these chapters is Tyson. Mm -hmm. Um about how protective he is of Percy and also I loved how when Percy just says go at the end when they're trying when he's like if I don't figure this out right now he's going to I'm I'm going to be eaten in five minutes mm -hmm. um how Tyson knows what he what he means and is able to get them out of there yeah um, it's the ultimate way to show Luke that he's a little bitch for Tyson to be the one to like get them out of there and for them to get away from him at all um, but it is like an absolute crazy thing that they experience that, uh, that like Annabeth didn't want Tyson to come, but if Tyson didn't come, they would have all died. Yeah. So it's like, he immediately proves that he needs to be here. Um, thank goodness. But it, it just like makes me, I don't remember how long her like distrust of him like lasts like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, the only reason she's hanging in there with him is because she trusts Percy so much and she's yeah. realizing, I mean, she realized from the moment before she let him into Camp Half-Blood that this Cyclops, for whatever reason, is that attached to Percy that he will do anything for him. And so yeah. I trust Percy because Percy wouldn't let this Cyclops hurt me. Yeah, and like somebody, um, Somebody left a comment on one of our videos that I post where they were saying like, oh, to try to like defend Annabeth for feeling that way about Cyclops, they were like, oh, well, maybe like she feels, she's like, well, in her defense, like all like Cyclops are usually not like Tyson. And I said back to them, like, is it that every Cyclops isn't like him or is it that they usually kill them before they even find out? Because there's no way there's no way that Tyson is the only Cyclops that is like this. It's just that he is the lucky Cyclops that lucky, I guess, like he, I honestly don't remember what this means, but in these chapters he says, or in the chapters before this actually, when he's crying and being like, I, I'll try to be a good monster. And he's like, maybe I shouldn't have been born. One of the things he says to Percy during that horrible scene is he says like, dad, dad used to take care of me. And like dad would be Poseidon. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me feel like Poseidon purposely put him there so that Percy would find him because if literally anyone else ever in this world found him, they would have just killed him without even finding out who he really was. Yeah. And so he can't be the only Cyclops like that. And like, if you're a Cyclops that hasn't done anything wrong, but these like demigod kids are trying to kill you or just demigods are trying to kill you in general you're gonna end up like hating them and using your powers to kill them um that's what's gonna happen and it's one of those things of like yeah there are some evil ones out there but maybe some of them aren't that bad but you just kind of almost inadvertently push them into doing that because of the like black and white kind of binary thinking that can happen and like a lot of this season is or not this season 
the show is these books and the show in general is about confronting a lot of that stuff because like what we were saying about Luke last time Luke is like eventually attractive dude who is liked by everyone he nobody likes to believe that really abusive people are good looking Mm -hmm. but they are and they're the ones that are usually the most dangerous almost because they get away with the most Mm -hmm. and so Luke is the most dangerous one Tyson would be like somebody that they would usually be afraid of but he's the one that's willing to do any anything at all to protect Percy and anyone who Percy likes. <laughs> yeah. Because and all it took was that Percy was just nice to him. Mm-hmm. Percy just like took care of him and would yell at bullies at school and that's literally that's like I was saying that about how Percy how much Percy is connected to um Annabeth and Grover is the same way with him and Tyson that all it mm-hmm. takes is somebody treating you like you matter and you're willing to like do anything at all to help to help them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just interesting to see the very aggressive <laughs> juxtaposition that is currently happening in these books. Yeah. And I just I always love how Rick Riordan writes this stuff that if you don't really know the myths or if you don't really think about it very much, you can kind of like miss it. But the more times you go back to the story, you're like, oh, wait, wait a second. <laughs> yeah what are you doing (laughs) like this is like my millionth time of reading this book and i'm like hold on hold what is what is hermes doing right now (laughs) like what is going on now i'm like so angry imagining remembering how he pops up at the end of the book and is like almost like mad at percy because the interactions with luke don't go well (laughs) they were never gonna go well dude oh my god like are you kidding me like percy can you just stab him with something even though nothing will like nothing will hurt him can you just do it anyway for your own like mental health and wellness <laughs> like it just like to think about the scene i always think the the scene before this that made me mad about hermes that i remembered being angry at him in, in like the first time i read these books was in the last book when he tries to blame annabeth for for um for Luke, you know, be, being possessed by Kronos and stuff. Um, and he tries to blame Annabeth for that and Percy like loses his shit on him. And then he ends up having to apologize to him. Um, but like in those books, especially, even especially after he dies, like he is so aggressively like Luke is a hero. Luke is a good person. You can't say anything else about him. He's good. He's like so like Percy's literally standing there next to his dead body in like a sarcophagus. and and hermes is still saying that stuff to him and it's like i will kill you in your sleep you don't you don't sleep i don't think because you're a god but i'll do it i'll find a way to do it anyway and it's i'm really interested to see how lin-manuel miranda will play that stuff of somebody it's very similar to luke where somebody who seems like a really nice happy guy um but is like trying to get you to do like the like little worst things you can possibly ever do for your mental health (laughs) and that's just all he asks you to do yeah like there's there's no explanation for how much he forgives luke for because i think like i still cannot find a better comparison for luke than anakin like yeah the idea that, um, you know, he knows everything about this organization he's up against. I know, like, it's not necessarily the Jedi that he is up against, but he's up, up against the demigods. He's up against the um, establishment of Olympus, I guess. And um, he, yeah, he has inside information. He's had experience with these younglings that he kills because, you know, they're like, Master Luke, and, or not, sorry, Master Anakin, when he comes in thinking he's going to save them. Um, and we saw that he was capable of that before he turned evil because of the sand people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and actually Star Wars is a good one for that because um, Kylo is very similar to that where the whole backstory with Kylo is that they're at like the Jedi Temple of Luke's on whatever, I forget what planet it is. Um, but he has, you know, the whole thing that they show us in The Last Jedi that happens where Luke basically gets scared in the moment that because he has like a horrible dream vision thing about Kylo killing everybody, he gets scared that Kylo's going to kill everybody. And so he thinks about doing like hurting him 
and then realizes that's so fucking st- what the hell am i doing that's a very luke skywalker thing to like be impulsive in the moment and then like calm down he does that often and but of course like kylo wakes up and sees him doing it and but like the the thing that i used to bring up in star wars arguments all the time and i was like did you know that when you see somebody in your room trying to maybe think about hurting you that if your reaction to that is to not only try to kill them but kill all of your friends um you're not in the right <laughs> like did you did you know the more you know but like that was one of the funniest things happened in like star wars back in the day i was like do you guys realize that yes luke made that decision but if your reaction to that is to kill everyone everyone that is around you then he's kind of has a point (laughs) because most of the time people who like aren't you know thinking about stuff like that they wouldn't react like that to something like that like they just they wouldn't see that as an option and so anyway kylo doing that um like killing all these kids that were there training that are his close friends he knows everything like han and leia are his fucking parents like luke is his luke is his uncle he knows everything about everyone he's connected to everybody every single thing he does like gives everyone great like psychic damage and just like pain because it's him doing it and he like loves that about it (laughs) Um, but it's still like he knows everything about everything. He knows everyone personally. And it's so it makes everything that he does so much harder to for them to deal with. And that's it's pretty much like that's why I hate I like refuse to watch The Last Jedi because that movie is just him manipulating Ray nonstop. And I'm like, why would I subject myself to this? Even though there's scenes in this movie that I really enjoy. Um, I don't want I don't want to. But it's it's the same thing but like sim- very similar to Luke where Luke knows everything about everyone and he uses that to manipulate everybody and kind of gets off almost in the same way that Kylo does of knowing that the things that he's doing is hurting like h- hurting them and making them so sad and leaving them feeling like destroyed and horrible and he he like likes that about it like he feels so entitled to getting what he wants in the same way that kylo and anakin do that they feel like because they don't get what they want that everyone should die they should all have to deal with like their righteous anger and if anyone gets in the way then it's their fault for getting in their way and it's not their fault they have to they're forced to kill them um it very much reminds me of people like my dad that are like it's not my fault that I had to do this to you. You forced me to do this to you because you're like disagreeing with me. That's very much how they, how they talk. And so like hearing Luke be like, oh, Thalia would be on my side is the exact sort of thing that people like that would say, or him even being seeming to be surprised that like Annabeth is so angry at him and being like, oh, the gods have um, brainwashed you and you can't even imagine a world without them there. And it's like, it doesn't matter about the gods. They literally aren't okay with murder. Mm-hmm. That's that's literally it. It's not even a, but that like doesn't even occur to him because he's so up his own ass with his, with his like righteous anger that they just don't even, they don't even realize what people are even upset at them about. It's like, no, it's not about the gods making this world. It's about the fact that you are willing to kill all of these innocent kids that have nothing to do with you, that like nothing to do with this situation. They didn't do anything. So why are they the ones that are being killed first? Yeah. <sighs> he's a frustrating villain. Yeah. He's it's just amazing how he's like, I am doing this because I want to help everybody. And the gods are bad parents and the kids at this camp deserve better. So in response, I'm going to kill all of you. And do all of you a favor so you can all go to Elysium and your lives will all end while the godparents that you're that I'm so angry at are still alive. Because they're immortal and they can't die. Like only you will die, but somehow I'm saving you by ending your life first. That's pretty much his argument. <laughs> while he's treating people to disembowel them, so he's not even planning on killing them swiftly. No, killing them and I'm not going to say it, but like the, the, the fight scene at the end of this book is just, it's really bad. <laughs> it's like really bad what he puts Percy through and it's going to be really hard to watch that on screen. Um, 
like the uh, a friend of mine showed me like pictures from like the graphic novel of that fight scene and it's one where when percy gets back to camp he's still like hurt like he has like bandages on him like across like his chest from luke's knife yeah and or his sword and stuff and he walks around like that like limping and stuff for a while despite like the magical like evident like ep, like you know medicine and stuff they take that's supposed to help you get better faster but like he hurts him so badly during that scene that it takes him like days to recover um and that's just like one thing that happens with him but and like that scene he's not even there isn't even like a reason necessarily like percy has a reason for why he's doing it but he basically just like insults him and it, luke gets that mad at him that he does that to him and so it's like somebody like that is so out of control that there's no way of ever knowing like what they're going to do next mm -hmm. and it's just going to be really intense to watch that and have to sit there and watch it knowing even knowing that it's coming like part of these the show is so fun is we know that these scenes will happen we don't know what things they'll change that make that will make the story better along the way but like the there's so much anticipation to these like certain moments and the first season um did a really good job of making them as important as they are like the i mean the tunnel of love scene in the first season that is like a one of those scenes in the books that people would think about as like the first time they like foreshadowed like percy and annabeth getting together one day in the future but that scene wasn't even like that huge of a scene necessarily when you read the books and the way that it is on the show mm -hmm. and so they're they do a good job of like having these huge scenes happen that there's so much anticipation for and them still paying off and so i'm like i'm a little bit almost like nervous about because i'm like this is gonna suck <laughs> to to watch all of this happen i was like they're only gonna get better acting wise playing their characters as more time goes on. So this is going to get harder to watch in a really good way. Um, but it's still going to be really intense to see this stuff happen. Yeah. It's fun. It's exciting, but it's definitely going to be a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I know you brought up Charlie playing Luke during this. Like, <laughs> if he does a good job, he really is going to be one of those people you can never see the same way again. I know, like, the first one that ever happened for me is there's this more modern adaptation of Othello that had Julia Stiles back when she was kind of in her big moment when it was like yeah. the time of Save the Last Dance and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was this adaptation of Othello and Josh Hartnett plays the bad guy. I forget the bad guy's name, but like I literally saw this movie once, probably only saw a few scenes of it because I remember adults shooing me away and being like, you can't watch this scene. Um, but still i cannot look at josh hartnett that was like when everybody had a crush on him and i was just like no no he's evil i don't like him <laughs> like um and yeah you you mentioned kylo ren but like there are people who will play bad guys so well that you can never see them again the same way like a, a more more recent one for me is saltburn the main guy which i know you didn't watch that like it's not necessary to watch it but um the main character the twist is he's like super manipulative and um like everything was underhanded and after seeing that like he goes from being this little nerdy guy that you feel sorry for to like holy shit he is an evil genius and i hate him <laughs> like i know there's other movies or books that i've read like that where like the actor plays something like that and i'm like oh my god i can never look at you the same way again. I'm like trying to think of them, but it's hard to think of one like that off the top of my head, but I know exactly what you mean. And Charlie is definitely gonna be like that because it's kind of funny. Like I, I talk about like Star Wars villains that their villains are always a direct like mirror of whatever is like the scariest thing in our society at whenever those movies come out. Um, but in a very similar way, like somebody like Luke is is like somebody that like runs rampant in our society right now like somebody who's like conventionally attractive and good looking is like has a lot of connections with a lot of people and so they're able to like get by 
and get out of situations that maybe they shouldn't have been able to get out of? Do they have like a tragic or like traumatic backstory? Have they been through traumatic things? Did their childhood suck? Yes, that's true, but that doesn't mean that they get to do the things that they do when they're older, but they do. And they tend to get away with it for many, many years because people just look at them and they think that they must be a nice person because they're just like, for whatever reason, people have this like predisposition to think that if you're conventionally attractive, then that means that you're a nice person. And so somebody like Luke, who is doing those things, but is using the fact that he's like, was seen as like an easygoing, like kind of nice guy who was easy to get along with and knew how to talk to people, was like an extroverted person um, who is so much like a Hermes kid where he just kind of easily knows what to say to people to get what he wants out of them. Somebody doing that but using it to be evil is, I see people like that on social media all the time. <laughs> like we see people like that right now. Like I feel like almost every day I see a video by someone who's talking about like a big, huge, a huge creator, like the huge creators on here that haven't said anything about Palestine and how people are like fed up with them or the, or worse, like the people who pretended like they cared because they didn't want to get like bash backlash and, but they never actually like talked to the families they were assigned and didn't really try to do anything. And so they like made those families give, have hope and then had it like get taken away from them again. It's like, don't do that just for, to like save your own ass or like people like Taylor Swift who will not say anything when something like this is going on when you know for sure that if she said one thing one time that like millions of dollars would be given to people in Palestine who are like starving to death. And so when you see people like that getting away with that stuff because they're good looking, because people know them and they trust them, they want them to be good people it's just, you're able to get away with so much more. Like, I can't think of someone else, even in these books, that would be able to do what Luke does and have people still arguing on behalf of him. And the last book that he can still be saved. And even after he's dead, the fact that his dad is sitting there trying to convince Percy that Luke is still a hero and he's still a good person and he's not bad and don't be upset at him. And it's like, this dude literally spent the last five years trying to kill him more than anyone else and that's part of the whole thing that hurts percy's brain i'm sure is that um it's one of those things of like what what is why don't you care <laughs> that he wants to kill me like why isn't that good enough for you to realize what he's doing um but a lot of people who are victimized by people like that in our society now that's how they feel of like what do i have to do to get you to realize that this person isn't the right person and to stop trusting them and stop giving them money or just stop paying attention to them, whatever it is. Like even like Shia LaBeouf or whatever is very much that story of somebody who is a monster and he just goes away for a couple of years and people just are wanting to like welcome him back when he hasn't done anything to show that he's actually changed at all because there's no way that he has. He just like went away for a couple of years and that's and like Ezra Miller is probably going to do the same thing in a couple more years, he's going to come back and there's going to be people being like, hey, remember that time when you like tried to sex traffic indigenous girls that were all like 13 years old and like had guns and were like threatening them with guns when they like tried to leave. Yeah. Um, and people are going to be like, he's changed. <laughs> but it's just Luke is that person and it's really hard watching him be like that, but he is that person. Well, and, and, I mean, yeah. it's the perfect kind of villain for this age group, right? Because of the grooming aspect, because that is literally the type of people that like this, this group of teenagers, particularly this like 13 year old where they're semi going through puberty, trying to find themselves, they are more likely to fall victim to somebody like that, telling them who they should become or how they can become that way. Um, especially like when you think about with like the grooming aspect with Luke, like in the last chapter, um, Selena is the is his mole and she's the one telling him what's going on at camp. And she was just this nice girl that was like teaching Percy how to drive, how to fly a Pegasus. Right. You would never think that she was doing that. But 
he is telling her at this time that she needs to tell him what's going on at camp because if she does, less kids will die. Meanwhile, he is on this ship literally saying they're all going to be dead in a month, so I don't care. Mm -hmm. And it's just like that aggressive juxtaposition of what he is saying, what he is saying to the people that he's trying to groom versus what he is actually doing. It's, it's like, like you said, it's those moments with those characters and those in like those kind of horror or like scary things where you realize like, oh my God, they're this like thing that they've been doing is just completely a facade. Um, It takes a while for them to figure out because they're literally children. Yeah. Things like this happen all the time. And Luke is a really good example of someone who gets away with stuff like that a lot still. And it's good to remind them, like, just because they seem nice and they seem like a nice person doesn't mean that they actually are. You got to pay attention to how they actually make you feel. Yeah. And that's also why he's a perfect villain for this age group for like the, you know, the age group that the books are intended for. Um, because they they wouldn't see it necessarily either. And I mean, you mentioned influencers. That's where we're seeing it happen the most, where people are like, oh, I'm going to buy all of their merch. I'm going to support them. I'm going to go to all their events. And then, then they get canceled, you know, or something like that. Or like for whatever, like Discord freaks me out because... I swear every single story I ever hear about minors being groomed in a horrible way by somebody who's a YouTuber or an influencer or somebody on the internet, it always happens on fucking Discord. And so that's the only thing that I know about Discord is that all these horrible things happen on there because you can have voice chats with people in like a private room that nobody else knows about. Um, But it's that like sort of interaction of like, it's easy to want to I think that people, especially when the age group of like teenagers, you you don't, because of the age that you are, you don't want to believe that there's somebody like Luke that are doing the things that they're doing purely because they like, they want to believe that Luke is doing these things because he's been manipulated by somebody else, because he is misguided, because he believes that what he's doing is right kind of thing. It's really hard, especially at that age, unless you've had some really bad life experiences um, (coughs) to like grasp that he knows that what he is doing is like wrong. He just doesn't care about it. That's really hard for teenagers to like fully grasp is that sometimes people do know that they shouldn't be doing this and they just are doing it anyway. And so when people like that say like, oh, I'm sorry for anything at all, they want to accept it and they want to believe it because they want to believe that somebody isn't that bad. Mm -hmm. But like some people really are that bad. (coughs) Like that one girl, um, she's a woman, I call her a girl, like Colleen Ballinger or what she was doing with her fans. She 100% knew she shouldn't be doing that. She knew that what she was doing was inappropriate which is why she fought so hard against them ever coming forward and people listening to anything they ever said for all those years. Like she is a good example of, she used like the, um, like limerence sort of parasocial relationships she had with the people that followed her to make them believe that, you know, oh, I don't actually mean to do that. I'm just misunderstood. Or I didn't realize what I was saying was actually that bad. I just really like you guys. And I wanna get to know you because you guys seem like cool kids. And it's literally impossible as like the adult in a situation like that to explain. It's so hard to explain to a teenager, like, because you feel like such a jerk trying to tell them like, no, this person isn't, knows that what they're doing isn't right. You're not actually mature for your age. Anyone over the age of like 20, they, even 20 year olds, they know they can tell that you are younger. When somebody says, when you say that, when you lie and say that like you're 16, but you're really 13, nobody who's actually 16 would ever think that you were actually 16 if you were at 13. Like nobody actually thinks that. You can tell when you're at those ages how young that person is. But like when somebody is a charming, nice person and is telling them, you know, oh, you're just like mature and cooler than every all the other girls I know that are my age. 
you just feel so horrible having to like ruin that kind of like facade for them. And I can't even blame them for not wanting to believe it. Um, like I get frustrated with people online for who like stitch people's videos like that and like make jokes about those sort of grooming relationships happening because the more you do that, the less likely they're going to listen and the, lo the longer it's going to be for them to get away. I know it's, it's very hard to talk to teenagers about this sort of thing without them shutting you down. Um, it's very hard to get them to like listen because nobody wants to believe that, <laughs> especially like kids that age that are too young and just developmental wise haven't, unless you've been horribly traumatized as a kid, you just haven't been through enough to like understand that people could be that bad. And like stories like this with somebody like Luke is a really good way to try to introduce that idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I really, I appreciate what Luke, Luke, not Luke, <laughs> I appreciate what Rick Riordan does with these stories because he doesn't like, he doesn't preach to you. He doesn't tell you what you should be believing. He kind of leaves it up to your interpretation and like leaves it up to, for people to go, for kids to go back and like rethink about things after they have more information or whatever, like I think about like the whole thing with Calypso, that Calypso's myth is that she traps men on her island so that she can basically sexually abuse them um, because she just is willing to do that because she doesn't want to be alone. And so with like that sort of a backstory where in like her myth, Hermes goes to her island to get her to let Odysseus to finally leave after seven years of being trapped there um, so that he can finally go home to his wife. Like when when Percy is on her island and the first thing he sees is her talking to Hermes, like if you knew her myth, you would realize what is going on, that she's isolating um, Percy, that she is telling the gods that Percy wants to stay when actually the entire time Percy is thinking about how much he wants to go home. And like if you know her myth, you will realize or like look up her myth, you would put that together. But he's not going to like hit you over the head with like something like and like an anvil or something to like tell you, you just read what she does. But when you go back and read that later on, you realize like how weird the things that she's doing is and how weird it is how she responds to Leo later on. And you just kind of have to put it together. And that's honestly the only way that kids that age are going to figure this stuff out. Is like somebody pointing out like, hey, Calypso's myth is about her raping boys like or men on her island and percy is on this island and she's talking to hermes and everyone who talks to him seems to think that he he wanted to stay and is surprised that he wants to leave when he has no idea what she's what they're all talking about mm -hmm. like hephaestus and chiron and hermes all are like surprised that he wants to come back as if he ever said that he didn't want to and he's confused because he's a 14 year old child yeah when you're not the 14 year old child anymore you can read that and be like what is this bitch doing <laughs> but like that's basically like luke's whole thing as as these books go along is that like happening over and over again of realizing like oh like who is who is this guy yeah um so i think the only other thing we didn't cover yet was the grover part of the dream which is just <laughs> It's a combo of the Odyssey. So we have him doing the trick that Penelope did on the suitors with Polyphemus again and literally watching him undo his own weaving and redo it at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's probably lucky. He probably learned how to weave at camp, I'm guessing. You know, they probably teach a course in it. Um, but I just, I imagine him not even doing his best at the weaving he is doing because, you know, he's... A, Polyphemus isn't going to see it, and B, he's just doing it to pretend. So, yeah, it's just... I'm I'm just, I'm laughing, just, like, imagining Arian filming these scenes. <laughs> oh it's going to be hilarious. That's the part I'm most looking forward to. Like, oh, my God. Every... Like, it's going to be, like, necessary, very necessary, like, comedic stuff, because everything else is so intense. Like, Luke is intense. The stuff that happens with Clarice and Cersei's Island and the backstory with with like Luke and Thalia when they were younger, all that stuff is like very intense stuff. And so having these like scenes where like Percy feels pressure, he had to like save Grover, but these scenes are also just Grover wearing a wedding dress, like 
talking with like a high pitched voice, acting like he's a woman, fooling like a ridiculous cyclops. <laughs> it's just it's gonna be it's gonna be a nice break from all of the horrible other stuff that's going on. I hope that and they put just... at least one of those per episode until we get to Grover. Yeah. And like Aryan is so like the behind the scenes videos of him filming that are gonna be also worth everything that has ever happened in our lives <laughs> like every struggle for the next year is going to be worth it to see those behind the scenes videos of him when he's filming those scenes because i'm like who is who is going to be playing like the voice for the cyclops <laughs> and things like that is there going to be like about i'm just picturing like a behind the scenes person in like a, a weird like suit like they wear just standing there and somebody else having to like be the voice or something because that's just going to be so funny to film just period even without seeing it on screen yeah. oh my god but it's it's that's just gonna be so funny um and it's our it's definitely gonna be like Aryan's time to shine is like every episode is gonna be like this is all so intense but Aryan wears a wedding dress and like his comedic timing is just from his tiktoks alone is so funny that he's going to have probably the time of his life <laughs> filming those scenes yeah <laughs> it's gonna be the highlight of the season for sure <laughs> i'm just picturing like when they get to his island and them seeing him in that dress and just being like what's going on buddy <laughs> I, I also do appreciate that percy being a 13 year old boy is like okay this is actually really funny but i can't laugh right now yeah it's like this is he's like i have to be serious though <laughs> like yes my best friend is wearing a wedding dress. I don't know what's going on here. This is very strange. But also he's like saying that he's going to die soon. So I can't make fun of him about this right now. But later on when this is over, there's yeah. going to be so many jokes about this that people are probably going to get tired of, of them hearing it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah. And like on, on the series front, I guess the other thing we could kind of mention is all of the kids recently went to Disneyland and posted a bunch of pictures, but one of the people they included is not in the cast. And you were telling me a lot of people are fan casting her as Talia. Yeah, her name's, I believe her name's Danielle Jade, and she's a black actress who lives in LA. She's friends with Leah. And so I've seen her before the last few months. Um, she has a TikTok account and Leah's TikTok account can like never stay on here because that's like the one thing people can do to her is get that account banned so that's what they do um but she'll like randomly show up on her friends TikTok videos and so she's uh, made videos with her before and she's somebody that a lot of people have speculated for playing Thalia because um since Lance Reddick is black um and Zeus is her dad that the person who plays Thalia should be like black at least like mixed black um be considering that that's their dad in in like this version of the story and so she's already friends with all of them because she's been around them before since she's friends with leah mm -hmm. and like she's i've seen her in like videos and stuff with charlie and dior like doing things together um the last few months when they're not filming or anything so she's around all of them and so if she was able to get the part that would be kind of that would be kind of like the best case scenario probably because she already knows them all yeah. and so it wouldn't be there wouldn't really be a transition of bringing a new person into season three because thalia is such a huge part of season three yeah and so that would make it very easy for them all if she is able to get it and it just feels like being like 39 and like being part of fandom since I was 12, um, I'm like, I feel like this might be one of those weird things where later on after we find out she got the part that we all look back at that and be like, oh, no fucking wonder <laughs> why she was there. Like actors do stuff like that where they like do incognito things in front of everybody and get off and think that it's funny that we don't realize what's going on. Like, um, Kelly Marie Tran, who play who has a part in the in the Last Jedi and the Last and Rise of Skywalker, she went to um, she went to Star Wars Celebration, like the huge Star Wars fan convention, uh, 
the year that that like the casting for the last jedi came out like she went to the convention when it was announced that she was cast in the movie but nobody like recognized her yet and so she was able to like walk around there with everybody like people i've heard so many stories of like stars of movies being at comic-con and like walking around with like a mask on and mm -hmm. just like talking to fans all day and they have no idea that it's them until like they post the video on their, like their social media later <laughs> and and so this feels like something like that. It would be really cool if she was Thalia and it would be not only because it would be nice that Leah wouldn't be the only like dark skinned black actress on this show anymore that she would have somebody else. So they would have to pick and choose which one to be racist to. But, <laughs> but like at least, and you know, it probably make things easier for them to be, to both be going through all of this together instead of, Leah being the one kind of taking all of it so much right now. Yeah, well, and I mean, the representation too, is it really matters. I mean, typically the character is kind of like a rocker chick, right? She wears like a leather jacket and she's supposed to be badass. Like, you don't see a lot of Black female characters like that. Yeah, and, and ironically, um, a Black woman is the one that like invented grunge music. And like was the one that came out with like kind of like emo music or what is called like alt style now and so they're the ones that started it but they always get superseded over by white people who like co-opt it later on mm -hmm. and so it'd be really cool to see because thalia is very much that person that like i <laughs> i looked up the sea of monsters movie like i i told you and watched it without the sound on because i don't hate myself that much but uh, I saw like a picture of like when Thalia wakes up in that version in, in the Sea of Monsters movie and when she wakes up they have her wearing a leather jacket. <laughs> it's just like she just like woke up with one ready to go because like when they see like when they think of like an alt like 16 year old that's what they picture is somebody wearing a leather jacket. She doesn't have to wear a leather jacket and she can still be like emo and things like that. That's just <sighs> But yeah, it's very true that the other thing with besides her with casting is I wish I like, I don't know if this would ever happen. Um, I feel like if the, it would happen, this show is like the best like hope for it to happen because of how their casting has been lately. But it would be like the coolest thing ever if Tyson was played by a, like an actually like autistic actor, mm -hmm. not like like somebody who is actually autistic. Usually autistic actors don't get that many parts. Um, and things like that. But it would be really cool if he could be played by somebody who actually was because he so much is um, very similar to how we act. And so it would be it would be a chance for them to have somebody who's at least openly disabled as playing a character that is also disabled. Like you never know with the other cast members, they could easily have a disability they just don't want to tell anybody about and they don't have to. But he is like, I feel like the, the this show's at least best chance to have to, op to have somebody who is openly disabled and open about it and and like work with him with that character especially yeah. and it, whoever it is i'm like the, he has to be the first one that they're going to tell us about um because he's obviously in the first episode yeah and so everyone is pretty much just dying <laughs> to find out about him particularly um but it would be cool to see danielle as um as Thalia is, but I just hope we'd see, I don't know how we, they wouldn't have flashbacks. That would yeah, be interesting to include them. with Luke too. Um, mm -hmm. Next week will be like, I think the flashback things that Annabeth tells Percy about when he's like, why do you hate Cyclops so much? Can you please give me your backstory? Um, so he understands what's going on, but I'm sure that they would, and it's a good way to show how much Luke has changed to show or even give like clues about who he is to see how he was back then versus how he is now um because it's not like that stuff just like came out of nowhere some of that stuff was around during those years too they just you know they just didn't even realize it at the time well yeah because I definitely wouldn't have seen it and I mean, she probably won't even be the most reliable narrator of how it went down because of being seven years old, you know, like the, the rose colored glasses about who Luke was to her. Yeah. And that I, 
that's what I appreciate about these series is that like everything is from Percy's perspective and a lot of the videos that I make on TikTok where people like will leave me comments and I'll say like just because Percy the traumatized child like literal child doesn't realize or doesn't think that somebody realizes that somebody is like using them doesn't mean that we as the audience should just accept that like just because he thinks that doesn't mean that we have to think that Mm -hmm. and that's like a whole thing reading these books is like and i that's why i'm i'm like really curious to see how they frame those like flashback scenes with luke um because i feel like us as the it's one of those Mm -hmm. things that us as the audience of like watching this happen will probably have a different feeling about that than Annabeth would when she's telling the story and Percy will definitely feel different about it than Annabeth would when she is talking about her own memories because it's just she you know she was young and that's just how that stuff goes um but it is a way for the audience to almost it's it's what I think is fun with these books is seeing it like how the characters in these books feel about people and then how as the books go along especially as the show goes along how different the audience will probably feel like especially in at the the stuff with luke is just going to be really hard for people to justify even just in this book this next season alone and so like even though we know what happens in the other books like we'll be like okay like i get why annabeth says that but also can somebody stab luke (laughs) I think is how this is going to go. Um, But that's like, that's why these being turned into a show is such a good decision because it gives you the chance to like flesh out the world so that people can realize those things in a way that is harder for kids, especially to recognize when they're just reading a book. Yeah, yeah. Rick, I mean, it happens in real life too. Rick wants us to see that Mm -hmm you can be manipulated without realizing it by having even Percy be manipulated and not realize it. And you're literally mm-hmm. reading his experience. Yeah, Percy's like, everything's fine. This nice lady just like took me on an island and and everything is, it's, I'm sad that she doesn't get to stay, that I have to leave. And, and he doesn't see that like her telling him this stuff is already manipulative. Like her, him feeling like he has to like, console her feelings when she is the adult is already like the biggest red flag ever when he's like sitting there consoling her because he has to leave and it's like okay you just almost died and now you have to go back and do and be like the prophecy kid and you're like trying to make somebody else feel better it's like this this is not how any of this is supposed to go but he's you know he's a kid so that's how he's gonna feel about it or even like the the even like the Luke stuff in this book is, it's just, that's how he's going to feel about it. And for us, we can see like how difficult this is all going to be for him going forward, but he's just living it. Um, and it, so we just have to like kind of strap in and get like ready to go through all this stuff for all these books. But yeah, it's just one of those things of Annabeth can be like, I know Luke and he wouldn't, I don't want to believe that he's like, that he could never be redeemed. And it's one thing for her to say that, but it's another thing to actually have to like, literally watch him do the things that he does. And it's like, okay, uh, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, it'll, and again, it'll be interesting to see how they play this off because Annabeth already knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could, the thing that I think is like fun about these books is that with Luke at least, um, there's a lot of stuff like charlie did an interview with a fan podcast the one i told you about that is like very anti-luke that i feel like i need to listen to because he's anti-luke um like in in like their instagram stories the other day they posted a a video of somebody saying like listen to this podcast because it's the most anti-luke podcast out there and he put up like that emoji that's a hand like this and i was like oh thank god that there's somebody like that around um and so it was he said to like to charlie's face it's interesting like interviewing her you because i hate your character (laughs) and and like he he because and it makes sense because he is the one that started reading the books when he was an adult when he was like our age and so yeah people like our age are gonna have no like we're gonna have sympathy for luke but not that much you know we're not gonna have to go through that process like younger people do 
But during that interview, like Charlie was talking about the Titan's Curse book, where there's a bunch of scenes where um, Annabeth is with Luke when she is kidnapped by his people and she's being like tortured by him and like charlie said like there's scenes there that probably happened that the audience never saw because she because all the books are from percy's point of view Mm -hmm. and the show now has an option of of showing what those were because i can only imagine like the psychological like warfare that he engages with her in that in that season and that we just didn't see it has to be a lot because in this book she's yelling at him about how he's a monster and she hates him and then in the fourth book she's like not talking to percy because she doesn't want to admit that he was right about luke all along and still wants to believe that he can be saved and is like mad at and is mad at percy because luke can't be saved and so obviously things happen between the two of them where he started messing with her in that book and like this show has the opportunity to like go into that and show that happening and have the audience have to sit at home and like screaming, <laughs> watching yeah. it happen and not be able to stop it. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. And even even in flashbacks, seeing him winning over little baby Annabeth. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah, there's a lot of opportunity for things like that to explain her perspective without taking away from like Percy's perspective that will be honestly like really good for kids to see because abuse is never that easy Mm -hmm. and it's not that simple to just be like you think this way and that's it the end goodbye it's way more it's so I think the thing that is so funny to me about abuse stuff with like therapy is that the longer you're in therapy the more complicated everything gets like when you first go, it feels so black and white, like about my mom is a bitch because of this and things like that. And then like five, six years into it, you're like sitting there being like, well, my mom did make these mistakes and she did these things, but those happened because this happened to her when she was a kid. And and I'm la, 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 la. <laughs> and you're just like, the longer it goes on, the more you understand how complicated all this actually is and that it's nowhere as near as black and white as you wish it would be because it would be much easier if it was. But it's never like that. <laughs> Um, And it's like, I feel like these books as they go along are going to be just that happening in front of us of it's a lot hard. It's easier to just be mad at Annabeth for being so aggressive with Luke stuff with Percy in the later books. It's a lot harder to be as mad at her when they show us scenes of Luke literally like, uh, like emotionally abusing her in the way that he had to have been Um, beyond the other stuff that we know actually did happen. He definitely was. There's no way that he, what, like, he shows up at her house and is like, run away with me. Uh, so, like, that's, that's, you can't get more blatant than that. That's, like, literally something that you would see in, like, the newspaper in the 90s about somebody being groomed by somebody in an AOL chat room and then them showing up at their house. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's the kind of stuff that we used to see all the time. So, we know, and that's just stuff that we know about. There's a lot of things that they could add in that aren't in the original books that could bring more context to stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, they did a great job of that with Sally and Poseidon mm-hmm. in the first season where that background on Sally just made her so much richer. It made her such a more interesting yeah. character. And so, one of the, the yeah. thing about those those flashback scenes, like the flashback scenes with Sally and Poseidon and then um, having like the war start happening and Percy having to go there to stop it and and Annabeth being there during like the Luke fight. Those are things that I never would have thought that they would change before I saw it. Like that's not any, like if you go back in time and like find old TikTok videos of people trying to speculate what they would change, no one ever thought that they would like have Poseidon and Sally flashback scenes and then they were and then they were happening and everyone was like oh my god why have I never thought of this before this is mm-hmm. like amazing and so that's it, people ask me sometimes like oh what do you think is gonna what they're gonna change in season two I'm like I have no idea and I'm not even gonna try to figure it out because they're smarter than me <laughs> like I have I have no idea no clue but whatever they do is gonna be a really good idea based on what they did in the first season yeah, that I don't even want to try. Hear, unless we hear Rick dropped out of it, then yeah, I'm. That's not, not going to happen. Yeah, 
Yeah, hopefully they keep him happy and it's not going to be like a situation with a live action avatar where like oh, all nice. of a sudden we hear, oh, the creator pulled out. Um, yeah, that's the only thing I could see ever tanking this series. Yeah, the, and like the thing that is really a good thing to say about this series for people that worry about stuff like that is that Rick is one of the writers and and so he's not physically there in the way that the other writers are but um he's there often enough they can't make any changes on in any of the scripts without like him signing off on on like all of the changes himself like they have to literally ask his permission when they were filming with not filming when they were figuring out the like the scripts um for this season he was the one that says like i want this to happen and this to happen and this to happen like he came up with the the eight episode like um i can't think of the outline he came up with the eight episode outline himself okay. and what things from the books that weren't in the first season that he wanted to add into this season and then gave it to the other writers and so like everything is going with what he wants he's on set literally every single day with these kids like i honestly think that if he left the show that the show would just stop because i'm not sure that any of the kids who are who are like contractually obligated granted with this show but i don't think any of them would want to do it if yeah. he stopped doing it because he's there with them on set every day and is you know someone that they can talk to about their characters and um that they all talked about they talked to him about about everything about you know what they were doing and he told them they're all doing a really good job and and to keep going and stuff when they felt insecure about all that kind of stuff and so honestly if it luke if he wasn't in the show anymore it just like it would just stop at whatever season it was yeah I, like because also like the backlash from like the fans would be so nobody would watch it yeah like, it, it would be it would be like the movies again where people might watch it because they're like morbidly curious but nobody would trust it where like the whole weird thing with like avatar on netflix is a lot of people watched it but most people who watched it were like watching it being like i'm curious how bad this is that was kind of they were like wanting it to be good but then after the first couple episodes were like i feel like i just need to watch this just to see where this goes but it was more like not like hate watching but almost watching something that is bad on not that great on purpose and still enjoying it because it's just kind of silly but that was a, so like that show got a lot of views but um but it's it's like i'm not sure that a lot of people actually liked it <laughs> yeah well, and so it's one of those that's netflix is so hard with that where like i don't watch anything that comes out on netflix because they cancel everything and so I refuse to watch, and that literally, like, I saw videos about this today, so I was thinking about it, but like, because there's some new show that just came out on Netflix that people really like, and it's not getting as high of ratings, and it's because for years now, for like the last decade, every really good show they ever do, they cancel it after the first season because they don't want to spend the money on it. And so like, nobody trusts them anymore. And so when something is coming out on Netflix, you're like, kind of just kind of assuming that it's not going to be that good but you're just going to watch it anyway, because maybe it's something you care about, or you just kind of want to see how bad it is. That's like their reputation. Yeah, at this point. And so Disney doesn't want to become someone who does something like this with their properties too. That's the last thing they would ever want to do. And so I honestly am not worried at all about Rick ever leaving this production, especially because of how he is literally <laughs> the dude in charge. <laughs> like, he's yeah. the one that is coming up with everything um uh, like the one example i can think of where a a writer left that things well they were still bad but they could they could have been worse was gilmore girls so yeah. when amy sherman palladino left i know like lauren graham even wrote about this in her book she was the one advocate advocating to keep the show going in the direction that amy sherman palladino wanted and um that probably saved some of the storylines, not all of them, of course, but it definitely saved the overall direction at, that it headed in. And that story was, that's like insane. That whole thing with Amy Sherman Palladino and Gilmore Girls is like one of those behind the scenes stories 
I tell like Gen Z people about because I'm like, here's a really good example of somebody who absolutely is self-sabotaged and just not even self-sabotaged, just sabotage and destroyed their own thing that they made because they were mad that the network wouldn't give them enough money for however much they wanted. She absolutely like wrote them into the worst corner humanly possible on purpose. Yeah. So that there was no way that they could ever recover without her doing it. There's no other reason for the whole April storyline and literally ending the season with Lorelai cheating on Luke with Christopher. Yeah. Like she did that on purpose to make it absolutely impossible for them to be successful without her. And that is a horrible thing to do to you, like your creation to know that all the fans that love your thing are we're the ones that are screwed over by this happening you're gonna be fine and write like a weird like ballet show that was like similar enough that people were like i feel like i'm watching gilmore girls again and i don't like it <laughs> um but that was like the most wild thing like that that i've ever heard of and i've heard of a lot of stories like that of like behind the scenes thing where she absolutely like ruined her property just because they wouldn't give that was like the craziest story like i remember hearing that about that in high school and being like oh there's no way like all of the like articles and stuff that came out about it were like there's no way that they're not going to come to an agreement about money because gilmore girls was such a hugely popular show at the time people were beyond shocked when they announced that she was leaving her and her husband were both leaving mm -hmm. it was like is this real yeah like I cannot even fathom that that actually, and then especially how it went. That's probably the best example or Joss Whedon left. Um, did he leave Buffy the Vampire Slayer or they just like switched? I didn't finish it. Switched. Like I haven't even gotten to the part where uh, Willow's girlfriend dies. Like I have oh, barely gotten into it. Tara. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Buffy is such a weird show to think about. I watched it a lot when I was in my I watched it a little bit when I was in high school um and then but I watched I watched season season five I can remember watching season five and season six and liking both of them um and season six was the one that was on like UPN when they like switched networks and stuff was when that happened but um that show is so weird to think about now because Joss Whedon is horrible and it's very obvious now when you look back at his show and I remember thinking that at the time but so many like certain things, not liking certain things. Like and I can remember being in college and like ranting to a friend of mine who also loved Buffy. Like, why don't any romantic relationships ever work out on this show? Like they he like went out of his way to destroy every single one in ways that don't make any sense. Like like the one the best example for that is like Xander and and Anya. Like he they happen in like later seasons and they're together for many seasons and then they're going to get married and he breaks them up for a, just a stupid reason. Like basically Xander gets like scared of getting married and blah, 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 whatever, blah, blah. Um, but then they like never do anything with them afterwards. Like they get, they break up in like season six and then season, you know, seven and eight happen and neither of them ever really date anybody else. Neither of them really, like move on past that and they basically just get back together in the last season and then Anya dies <laughs> in the last season like towards the end and that's like the end of their story and I'm like this is such a waste of a like why did you break them up in their on their wedding day why not just have them be together if they're going to be in scenes together for years after that basically acting like a couple anyway yeah like it just stuff like that happened all the time like every single romantic relationship could never work and it just became so obvious like i know this is going to end somehow i'm just waiting for him to do it and it, i'm going to be pissed off watching it regardless but it that and like the other thing with joss whedon stuff with that show is well not only that angel turns bad whenever he has sex with buffy remember that bothering me back 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 then too of being like excuse me like what it but also, um, Amber Benson, who plays Tara, mm -hmm. now, one of the things that fans were upset about back then is that she was obviously a series regular after she started dating Willow in like season four. Yeah. So season four, especially season five and season six, she was a regular person. She was in every episode, but she was never in the credits. 
And it was this weird thing that always bothered everybody who watched the show that she was never in the credits. Everyone else was in it. It meant that she made less money per episode because she wasn't like a credited lead. And then he put her in the credits of the episode when he kills her at the end of it. Of course. And I'm like, you're such a fucking asshole. Like, I remember being so mad at him during that time that it was like the one episode he puts her in it is the one that everyone was so happy about that for like 40 minutes until she's killed at the end of it. And the way that she dies is so like random. Like there's like a bad, there's like a guy who's just a fucking joke. Her, him and his friends are just stupid, like stupid, annoying, like- Oh, it's the three guys? Yeah, like the nerdy weirdos in that, that are mainly there as like the only thing that resembles something to make you laugh during season six. Like it's a very like difficult season. Um, And so he, there, one of them is like in, in their backyard, like yelling at, yelling at Buffy about whatever was happening, like plot wise with them at the time. And he has a gun and he just like shoots the gun when he's like waving it around and she's inside the house and the bullet like goes through her and that's how she dies. Oh my gosh. That's so like Willow like goes evil, like killing, like literally like flight, like, like rips his skin off his body and goes after the other two guys and they like try to help those other guys like hide out so she doesn't find them but it's looking back and like realizing who joss whedon is that xander is like his stand-in because he always has to have a stand-in for himself because his ego is like that fragile and like everything that he makes like clint in the marvel movies are is his stand-in in those movies which is why Clint gives like all this backstory in the last movie that he did for no reason because that backstory doesn't go anywhere or do anything or add to the plot or anything at all. It's just a waste of time. But like the end of that season, the way that like Willow is saved is that Xander gives her like a big like speech of like, remember when we were little kids and we became friends in kindergarten because we wanted to play with the same crayon. And that's like what brings her back. And I'm like, why do I feel like this entire thing happened so that you can make Sandra the hero? Probably. <laughs> like, I feel like that's the only reason that you killed Tara and all of this other stuff with Willow happened was so you could find a way for him to be the hero. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the the Willow or Buffy is another good example of things like that happening too, where just a lot of the same themes um people also being so mean to dawn oh my gosh i remember being annoyed back then that people that so many people just hated her yeah i was like isn't that like i don't know what's going on here either but like why does everyone being so mean um actually if you want to hate joss whedon look up joss whedon and michelle trentenberg on google oh oh okay uh she when everything came out about Joss Whedon, like his when his ex-wife uh, wrote like an essay thing about him a couple years ago, talking about how abusive he was, and that he used the fact that people thought that he was a feminist or whatever during those years on Buffy and stuff as a way to like silence her basically, and for him to get away with it and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the like a lot of the cast started talking about things, and it was very it was fucking obvious even back then at least to me that he had like favorites on his cast and like the person who played willow was one of his favorites um the person who played fred on angel was another one of his favorites because she her character dies but he still finds a way to like keep her in the show even though her character dies and turns into a like a demon the demon just becomes like a new character on that show for no reason like no one knows why she's there and it's like the most weird way that she there's no point like why did you kill her why did you kill fred if you kept the actress there why not just have fred like stay for like the last season of the show before it ended up getting canceled it's so weird anyway um but like michelle but like it might sound um surprising but sarah michelle geller was not one of his like favorites because she would stand up to him about stuff and so he didn't like her like he used to have cast members to like compare this to um quiet on set stuff where the guy that was a predator with drake bell would have him would have drake bell go to his house to like practice lines because that was his job was to help them learn their lines and i was like you're the worst 
person doing that job in the history of the world, if you need the cast to come to your house at night after hours where nobody else is there but you, yeah. um, in order to teach kids how to learn their line, they don't need to, that's like, that's a huge red flag just in general with a production if that stuff like that is going on. And Joss Whedon would have people like um, Allison Hannigan and people like that who come to his house to like read like Shakespeare plays. And only some of the people who were on the cast would go. And those were the characters that never got killed off or had like the best storylines and stuff. And that wasn't Sarah Michelle Geller. And so anyway, with Michelle Trattenberg, Michelle Trattenberg just posted when all of that was coming out and said that um, that it was a like a rule on the Buffy set that she was never to be alone in the same room with him. And that Sarah Michelle Gellar would literally like be her like guard dog and would like walk around with her and would never leave her alone with Joss Whedon ever. And it would like, you know, stand up to him to protect her. And I, whenever people talk about Joss Whedon stuff, whenever he tries to like come back, I'm like, I just want people to remember that this happened and wonder like what happened to her to make that be a rule. Yeah. Because something had to happen to her and the youngest that she was when she was on that show was when she was like 14 or 15 or something. And like, I grew up with her. Like she played- Yeah, Harriet the Spy and of stuff like I that. Loved, of course, I, I was an autistic kid. I loved Harriet the Spy. I loved those movies so much. I watched that movie so many times, so many yeah. times. Yeah, it was on repeat at my house too. Yeah, and so I even remember her when she was on Pete and Pete, but I like didn't like that show on Nickelodeon. It was. It was like yeah. too weird for me. My the, dad liked it because of Iggy Pop, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and like I I didn't like it. It was too odd for, I like couldn't, I didn't know what the, what was ever going on, but that was like, you weren't supposed to, it wasn't supposed to have a storyline pretty much. It was one of those sort of kid shows. Mm -hmm. But me watching it, I was like, what? I don't understand the point of any of this because nothing makes any sense. But I do remember her for all those years. And so, especially coming from, it's just scary to imagine like what happened to her to make her say that because something really bad, he must have done something really bad to like young teenage her in order for Sarah Michelle Gellar to have to literally like protect her mm -hmm. when she was on set with the guy who's in charge of the entire production. And so there's, and that's and not even, and that's not even bringing up the stuff that he did with Charisma Carpenter where he, she played uh, Cordelia Oh, he okay. was, she was on Angel mm -hmm. and they did this absolutely psychotic like storyline in season, I can't remember what season it was of Angel anymore, but Angel and Cordelia were like the thing that they were building up in that like romantic wise. And then, and it was a really good, it was like a really good storyline. Cordelia was a great character, especially on Angel. Um, one of my favorite things that people say about her is that she was autistic, which, yeah, she, she pretty much was. Like, the way that she says, she that line where she talks about, like, I don't understand tact, that's just not saying true things. Mm -hmm. That's every autistic person. <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much Cordelia, is, like, the popular girl, like, version of that, who has a special interest in, like, being, like, overly, like, feminine. Um, anyway. When she was on Angel, they did this absolutely psychotic storyline out of nowhere, where suddenly she was like, because Cordelia, or not Cordelia, because the Charisma Carpenter in real life was pregnant. And she didn't want to tell him that she was because she was worried about what he would do with her character on the show. And so she waited to tell him, and then she did. And he like acted like it was like the worst thing that's ever happened to him, that she was pregnant. And they did this crazy storyline where Cordelia was pregnant with like basically a demon baby. It was just like a crazy thing. It it made no it like they had like a half of the season where Cordelia was doing super out of character things where she was basically being like the villain. And watching it every week, you were so confused about what was going on. And then finally, after like half of the season, they she goes into a coma when she's pregnant, and you find out that she's like has been possessed by this like bad thing that like has like somehow gotten her pregnant with like something something whatever it doesn't matter the specifics of it anymore but like you get the idea of it but the season like like she does this really weird thing where she there's like this younger person on the show that's like a teenager like teenager early 20s i forget who he is now but he's somehow connected to angel 
and she starts like trying to be like romantic towards him and they do that for like half the season before they tell you that she's like possessed by like a demonic force that's basically forcing her to do this stuff so for like half the season you just think cordelia is doing these things and they made charisma carpenter act all of that stuff out when she was pregnant and then when she's pregnant she goes into a coma and she just like never wakes up from the coma and then after the fifth season is the last season of buffy or of angel she comes back for one episode where they and it's probably their best ep- i love that episode it's a really good episode with angel and cordelia but it's basically her saying goodbye to everybody and then at the episode at, at the end of the episode she basically like disappears and that's like the last time you ever see her but the behind the scenes stuff with her was absolutely horrific like the stuff that Joss Whedon put her through because she became pregnant he literally like forced her off of the show he wouldn't give her like the scripts anymore she they he wouldn't tell her what was she didn't even know what was going on with her character mm. like all that time when her character was like grooming this like young kid and stuff and doing just wild things that Cordelia would never know she had all these meetings with him and the writers of asking them what the heck was going on and they wouldn't tell her anything oh and God, he kept thinking. it all from her and made her like find out about it by reading like she found out that she was basically getting kicked off the show by reading the script when it got like sent to her house and it was just like the most atrocious sort of way that you could ever treat like somebody who's on your show like literally doing that to them because they just got pregnant like most shows just find ways to cover it up and then they just move on and it's fine but he like put her through hell because of that and just like and ever since then every time there's something with him happening um she'll just pop up and be like hi like i'm glad that everybody now believes me because back then people didn't as much they like try to make excuses for him yeah about why he was acting that way because open. Because they didn't want him to, they looked at him as like this great, like, he understands women. No, he doesn't. He hates women. <laughs> like, when you yeah. look at Buffy and actually look at what's going on, it's very obvious that he, that he has so many complexes. He never got over some girl, <laughs> like, turning him down in when he was in high school. He also never got over, like, jocks being okay. cooler than him when he was in high school because, like, he makes... In the Marvel movies, he when he writes Captain America in the Marvel movies, he makes Steve such a dick. Mm-hmm. Like, has Tony talk to him as if he's such an asshole? That is not... Steve is not like that at all. Um, Steve is like a tiny little skinny dude who was given something where he suddenly had muscles. But his whole storyline is he's this, like, weak person who had asthma and all these chronic illnesses where he like wanted to be a hero but he literally like physically could not do it and in the 40s like imagine somebody with like asthma and stuff like that in the 40s without any medicine for for him to be like taken care of and so his whole story is that people like literally like electrocute his brain (laughs) and to like make him into for his outside to match like how good of a person he is on the inside Mm -hmm. and um so for Joss Whedon to write him as like the cool jock guy is just like who that's not that's not him at all and it's purely just because he's insecure about the fact that Chris Evans is very attractive (laughs) that's literally that's the only reason because that's not Steve's actual character yeah Uh, we've gotten on a Joss Whedon trail but like to bring it back also one thing that I wanted to bring up about the production and where we're probably headed in the next couple chapters Mm -hmm. is I saw the interview with Dior and I think it was the last Olympian Mm -hmm. podcast where she mentioned that she's actually really looking forward to like piloting the ship and piloting a bunch of undead soldiers and um Mm -hmm. I mean, we've mentioned before the Confederate soldiers in the book, so we'll see how they they change that. Maybe there'll be mm-hmm. some other war veterans or maybe nondescript veterans that have semi recognizable, you know, it, uniforms, something like that. Mm-hmm. But I love that Dior is excited for it because I can see that feeling how she plays it. Yeah, and it's. Clarice is going to be, I feel like there's a lot of stuff with Clarice they could add in in this season to make her a more 3D character. I do remember that Rick 
said that when they casted her as Clarice. He specifically said that they he wanted to expand on her and make her more of like a real full-on person. She is she's much better off than a lot of like the kind of bully characters in a, most other YA things, but in the books, but there's still a lot they could add in a lot of things to explain kind of what she has to deal with for why she is so like angry and aggressive and stuff like that very more early on that would just help her as a character going forward because honestly like I remember watching an interview with Dior I forget where one of the podcasts she did and she was just talking about um how when she got the tryout when she heard about the tryouts for Clarice that she wanted this part so bad because Clarice is a very complicated character there's so much stuff with her that she goes through like really interesting relationships with different characters that are very unique that characters like her usually don't get to do like I'm trying not to be specific to like ruin to like spoil anything but in like season four or episode the book four and five there's stuff that happens with her with certain characters that are that are really interesting that usually don't get to be seen by especially characters like her and so she like was she wanted the part so bad because she wanted to be able to play like this very multifaceted character that she usually wouldn't get the chance to play where she was like asking her like agent like what can i do to like stand out when i'm trying out for this part because i want to get this part so bad <laughs> and like i forget like what they said but whatever they said clearly like i think she like learned how to sword fight or something like that a little bit before she started when she sent in like her tape so that to like try to impress them and like stand out a little bit but it's very true like that where Clarice is such a unique kind of character in that way and her being on the show is just gonna make her role just be expanded in a really cool way especially in this season because she goes through a lot of really hard stuff like for a while she's like alone on the island where Grover is just by herself and thinks that Percy and Annabeth are dead and Tyson are dead and that and she thinks she's just there alone, like stranded and and doesn't know how she's gonna do anything <laughs> like get the golden fleece or save Grover or live doing any of those things. And that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff she goes through. And a show like this has the chance of showing Percy and Annabeth stuff while also showing like her side of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's gonna be fun to see. All right, um, so I need to jump off soon, but um, so we'll read another couple, couple chapters for next time, and I'm still hoping we'll get news soon. <laughs> I mean, it's about to be summer break for these kids, so any day now, we're going to get something. All of the information about filming, I'll, I'll say, is August 1st is when they're going to start, and so I'm sure that, like, relatively soon, they'll do like official announcements for at least Tyson since he's in the first episode. Whoever yeah. would be cast in like the first episode, they'll pro I'm, I'm just guessing that they'll announce that stuff in like July at least because they usually do like a month of, at least like a month of like pre-work before they start filming. Mm -hmm. And so they would probably announce it when that kind of stuff is going on. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll at least get it in July. And but if we get it before then, that would be super. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel like they they have to be in some sort of pre-production right now. So they, yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that the like trio, you know, like Arian and Leah and Walker already are. Um, the other kids like Charlie and Dior and stuff. I know that they're like getting ready, like Dior posted something the other day about bulking up for for season two of Percy. And so I'm sure that it's not like they're not doing nothing, but I, I also think that the trio kids are pr the ones that go through the most training stuff, not only with like the script stuff, but just with like training with like water and all that kind of stuff that they have to do. And so I'm pretty sure that they are doing that right now. And it's just a matter of time where more of them are gonna like join them at a certain point yeah all right well i think we should call it there and mm -hmm. um 
yeah, so we'll read the next couple chapters. Hopefully, I, I can't remember when the Clarice stuff starts happening, but we got to be getting close to it, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, I don't remember anything in, enough about this book, but I do remember that it's pretty soon after they do like the flashback stuff that they run into her and the next chapter mentions the confederate soldiers <laughs> and so it has to be then yeah okay all right so we'll talk about that next week and yeah um so i'll talk to you later though yeah all right bye bye